Hi. Can you see me? I just did so I can't hear you though. <laughs> I just did so much work and it put you on the other side now. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was worried that this was gonna happen. It's okay, I could be snowy for today. Oh no, I can't <laughs> <laughs> I was dreading this because no. I was watching you switch around. I was like, "What if? Ha what if it happens that as soon as you turn, I turn on my video, it's gonna switch it?" Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right. So, bear with me while I do it the other way. <laughs> You, okay, Dr. Neuron will talk to you all and introduce himself while I fix this. Sound good? Sure, I can introduce myself. Uh, I am, you guys can call me Neurophobia or Neuro just for short. Um, I am one of the global health advisors over at the U.S. State Department. Um, I primarily deal with a lot of infectious diseases and a lot of humanitarian crisis settings. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the work I've done in the past. So I just to kind of give you guys a background. Um, I've been primarily working with a lot of stuff with HIV AIDS before COVID happened, uh, a lot of Ebola, malaria, tuberculosis. Um, those are just kind of like uh, some of the many things I kind of worked with. And there's some other like uh, rare tropical diseases as well that I have done with as uh, kind of dealt with as well. Um, I've, you know, done several tours through several countries as well during the process, like of like working with a lot of um, uh, developing countries and dealing with a lot of these infectious diseases. Um, and and kind of coming into this administration, so um, especially with the transition from Trump to Biden, um, I was invited over of a couple of other folks um, to work at the State Department for Biden's transition team uh, to specifically work on COVID um, and policy implementation of kind of a lot of work we're doing. Um, so the, a lot of this work right now has pretty much become 24/ seven of my work right now I haven't really touched on any of the other stuff but uh, that's good though because um, that means that I can come talk to you guys um, and this is not my first time I've done several other uh, interviews and Q and A's and stuff like that through a couple of other streams as well I'm a streamer myself uh, but I particularly do a lot of science communication um, in the health world so um, very uh, active on Twitter that's where I post a lot of information and kind of give updates on what's going on in the world. Uh, what are some of the misinformation and disinformation and just making sure we clear the records with a lot of the things that are going on. Um, so that's uh, kind of like my brief background on everything. Awesome. I'm still working on this. So you all feel free, <laughs> feel free to talk to Dr. Neuro. It shouldn't take much longer, but feel free to ask him any questions, you know, like, you know, what's your favorite food or something. While I get this, I'm almost done. It's like maybe two minutes. No, that's fine. I could take some initial uh, quick questions at the beginning. This is your time to ask like quick one-off questions at the beginning um, before we get into, hit into the main Q&A. Um, I'm happy to do that as well um, while we are just getting everything set up. So if you guys have anything you want that's been burning in the back of your brain to ask... Biden's announcement today about a mask. Yes, we will. I actually just tweeted about it a, a few seconds ago, Metric, regarding his, uh, uh, well, I don't think it's a question that was posed in it, but we did discuss recently regarding its updated guidance on masking. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, we have updated some guidance regards to mask, uh, kind of loosening restrictions regarding outdoor masking specifically. Uh, and so part of it really is just focusing on the fact that we have observed uh, many, many months of data, by the way, in terms of vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals, especially with the patterns of transmission with COVID, and have realized that, you know, a lot of outdoor events, especially when it's not crowded, um, that transmission is very unlikely and dispersal factor of the virus is very, is most likely happens. So uh, we've updated that guidance recently um, to basically evidence the fact that, you know, we can loosen some restrictions on outdoor aspects of, um, and also like for if you are vaccinated indoor aspects of that as well. Um, so many, many times a lot of folks have asked, like if I'm exercising outdoors, should I be wearing a mask? And uh, not, it's not required, but you know, so that's, that's kind of one of those things. Um, I think a lot of language that we were using before were mandates and we were trying to make sure we loosen some of that because that is kind of been the crux of many of the anti-vax sentiments as well from that perspective. So we try to, um, we, we tried to basically uh, graduate 
a lot of folks onto a path to say that there is a there is a light at the end of the tunnel and this is what we're trying to go with uh and not every policy is perfect i have my own criticisms of the guidance so you know like i said there's no feelings that are going to be hurt if you have criticisms regarding the Biden administration and how they're rolling it out. I do have my own criticism. So this is supposed to be an open and honest discussion on kind of how we're doing things. So, uh, but other than that, that's uh, my answer to kind of in general, some of the stuff right now. How hard did you laugh about the 5G conspiracy theory? I don't really laugh at many of the conspiracy theories anymore because uh, a lot of the conspiracy theories have just become to the point where uh, it has fueled a lot of anti-science movements, especially QAnon um, and what we call the health freedom movement. And it has it's gotten to the point, especially if you if you put it into my perspective that like I do this day in and day out uh, every day and it eventually gets to the point where people will tag you in certain threads or it'll they'll send you DMs. And I get a lot of uh, DMs and some of them are not that great. And, <laughs> and sometimes you just kind of roll your eyes and you just sigh and you just move on <laughs> um but i can laugh right now just because of that fact but uh there are folks who legitimately do believe in these theories still and um i think the best thing you can do is just kind of uh you know either just really kind of ignore it uh not give them any more intention that they need to or you just poke fun at it if you have to so um should schools still have mask mandates AC has listed here as a high risk but there's so for schools that's a different this, that's a very difficult question because it depends on several things uh one your community transmission levels uh is your area very like have high infection rates uh second how, what is your school doing because not all schools are created equal like is there good ventilation are you uh grouping are you making sure that students are distancing are you making sure that um you know staff are vaccinated um also so also like you know you know making sure that things are staggered too there's a lot of different things that uh come into play with school opening so there's never it's kind of been like a mini arguments among the, amongst the academics as to what constitutes a good school opening. Um, but I think we have general consensus on several things that need to happen before schools open. So it all it's, it all depends on where you're at and what they're doing with the schools and students and staff. Um, so uh, I could go into more details if you want to, uh, but that's kind of just my general answer for that. All right, we're ready. We're I ready. It. We did it. <laughs> Good. All right. Thank you all so much for talking to Dr. Nero. Um, we're super happy to have you, by the way. Thanks for taking time to chat with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I appreciate it. I'm excited. And you guys can see my husband walk in the background. Yay. <laughs> I also saw, do you have a dog? I saw, I think I saw a dog walk by. Or was that another animal? Oh, no, that's, that, that, is, that is legitimately my big orange tabby cat. Oh, but okay. It, I, for some, out of the corner around. of my eye, I thought it was a, a dog, but okay. Very cute. No, I have two cats, which actually, funny thing is that your story reminds me so much of when I had, um, so I have an older female cat. She, um, her name is Mako, and she's a torty cat. And uh, we got Bucket, who's this little orange tabby. We, we got him when he was just a kitten. So kind of similar situation with you. Mm -hmm. And we, we quarantined him in, this, in a separate guest bathroom also and did the scent exchange and everything. And it was, um, it got to the point where we finally felt comfortable. And I could tell you the first day we left him alone for a whole day was the most stressful thing ever. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, we have to take night into the vet on Thursday. So I'm just, I'm worried. Cause you know, we have to mm -hmm. take him out of the room and I don't know if fate is gonna react. We might have to section her off while we take him out. It might be a good opportunity to put her in the room that he's been in for a while. Like really just kind of get, let her, let her uh, get used to the smell in there. Um, we've just been kind of like, so we've, we've also done room exchanges as well, along with swap that uh, scent exchange. So they're used to kind of smelling each other's spaces. Oh, that's um, a good that's idea. Been, so that way it's like allows them to kind of get used to like, this is okay. So this is their space. This is their scent. This is where they're commonly at. And then, and I'll swap them back and forth. Um, and then eventually you can do su supervised play, but <laughs> that's always okay. a challenge. That's an idea. I'll have to consider that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But folks. enough about kitties. Yeah, we're going to dive into things because we have a lot of questions and we don't have all the time today, unfortunately. I wish we I wish we did because this is so great so far already. Mm -hmm. uh, but our, we're going to dive into 
questions pertaining to stop Asian hate, as well as just anti-Asian hate right now that's on the rise, especially since the pandemic started. And this has been something that I've been very active about uh, on my channel, on my socials, on Discord, just getting people to realize what's going on. And, and, you know, especially after the shootings in Atlanta last month in March, um, it kind of awoken something in me. Um, and mm-hmm. for me, I guess we should start off with our, I guess, uh, a little bit of a background about ourselves. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, I am Chinese American. And Dr. Nero? I am Chinese American as well. Oh, sweet. Well, there we go. And we, <laughs> uh, we're we both, you know, in the U.S., right? And we are of Asian descent. And so I think this is something that speaks to uh, not only us, but a lot of you out there too, right? And um, we wanted to kind of address some of this in terms of um, any questions you all had um, and as well as how to reach out to senators and, and about legislation that's important, uh, which, uh, by the way, um, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act did pass, uh, I believe with that as well, the uh, Jabara Hire No Hate Act. Was that also included? I can't remember. I think I read it was kind of a an amendment to that act, but I'm not sure. It was an, am- it was an amendment, and uh, I believe it's still <laughs> part of the deliberation, or it's at the final stages, or I haven't really checked it religiously on that one, so I can't really quote on that one, but if someone wants to fact check me and... Uh, and obviously as well, sorry, just to preface as well that for anyone here, um, please feel free to do your own fact checking. Um, it's always encouraged. I, you know, I've, I've made mistakes sometimes when I talk and um, I'm sure so can attest to that. So, you know, this is your responsibility for anyone as responsible information folks that you guys do your fact checking for everything. Um, doesn't matter what t- how many degrees or how experienced they are you should always still kind of do your own research and ask questions. So, um, but yeah, anyways. <laughs> no, I, I agree. Um, just just to clarify, this is all speaking from our personal experiences and what we know, what we've learned, et cetera. Um, so yeah, definitely do your research as well. Don't take everything we talk about here as gospel or 100% absolute truth, you know, always be questioning everything you hear, right? So, but we are going to talk about um, stop Asian hate first. And we do have our first question here from Don, who asked, what are some forms of racial microaggressions that many people do not realize, especially in the context of the anti-Asian hate that's been going around? A lot of people don't even realize that Asian people get discrimination and face racism. So what are your thoughts mm-hmm. on that? The first I would say is the whole model minority aspect. Um, I'll say that this is one I constantly hear that really kind of um, irritates me a little bit is uh, they'll say one of the many, uh, one of the first things I heard when we were talking about uh, Asian crimes is, well, Asians are docile. Asians are docile. They're not going to ever report anything. Um, and it's not a big deal. And I'm like, that's actually a complete falsehood that uh, per, um, perpetuates uh, the model minority as, um, you know, stereotype. And, for a lot of folks um, who want to know what kind of model minority stereotypes are, there are usually a lot of um, uh, stereotypes such as like the, what we call good stereotypes. And I say them in quotations like, you know, oh, Asians are good at math or Asians are uh, always doctors or things like that. These are all forms of stereotypes that actually, uh, if you look at it in the long run, are actually more negative. They actually impact things much more negatively than they do positively, uh, especially when we look at um, other minorities aspects as well. Um, it's actually what fuels a lot of interracial uh, aggression as well, because a lot of um, other minority groups will look at that and say, oh, well, you know, you know, blacks will have black versus Asian and all these other stuff. And that type of stuff, it reinforces this weird hierarchy of racism, I guess, or in the ra- racial slash ethnic groups. And so, um, so that microaggression really is not the best thing to do. Uh, and it's actually the most common one because a lot of people think, oh, well, it's a positive thing and I'm just joking. Um, the problem is, is that like when you do that, you don't think about the repercussions of other groups that are listening as well, uh, which is always the case when you talk about microaggressions is that um, it's not just necessarily about how you as a person who's, who's, who's talking about microaggression feels. It's about the feelings of the people that you are talking to and those around you. 
Um, and that's one of the many things we enforce as well when uh, talking with groups with microaggression as well, that we have to think about much more than just ourselves. We have to think about what are the feelings and the impact of other folks. Um, so that's kind of been my quick uh, stupid answers on that one. <laughs> how, how do you feel about a question like, where are you from? Do you get that? Have you gotten that growing up and mm -hmm. just in general? Do you still get it now? I still do get it. Um, I still, and I think one of the many things I, I think there's a way you can answer that um, I, 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 or question that, excuse me. Um, and I think it's one of those things that, you know, this is one of those weird situations where there is like from us, like there's a pride to like us discussing our, our, uh, our backgrounds, but there's also for the fact that sometimes uh, when there is no impetus for the discussion, right? Like if it's just random, like you're talking about, let's say if you're doing an interview with someone, right? And uh, it's for a job. They're asking you questions like, oh, let's, well, I'm going to interview you for a software developer job. Then randomly, one, or randomly, all of a sudden they ask, where are you from? To me, that's not appropriate because I'm like, that doesn't feed anything to this conversation. Are you evaluating based on my background? What what is the what is the what's the impetus behind it? And that's been that's one of those many things that I kind of like uh, I have I tell people to think about. I'm like, but you know, in the context of where I work, where at the State Department, where you have a lot of international, you, you your primary work is with international individuals, um, and there are sometimes individuals who will ask like, oh well, you know, like. Um, what is your ethnic background? I'm kind of curious and blah, blah, blah. I don't want, I don't want to, you know, uh, you know, care. I don't want to put down, you know, as like a Korean or Japanese or anything like that. I just, I'm much more curious about it. That, that's fine. Like if you're legitimately curious, there's a way to ask it. And I think as long as you preface it, um, that's fine. Um, but I think there's many situations where we have seen where people just flat out ask because, um, they need they need to create that box for you. Yeah, like and it has no relation to what you're talking about or what's going on, right? It's just like, mm -hmm. why does that really matter? And it, mm -hmm. I think it feeds into that whole, you know, perpetual foreigner, which is something you'll hear a lot in terms of the the discussion around the racism that Asians face is that we're, we're never going to be accepted as American, even though Dr. Neuro and myself are American. You know, we're, we're American citizens, but... There is that that feeling of being a perpetual foreigner because they're always asked people are always asking where are you from right and and in a lot of cases I think people are just genuinely curious right mm -hmm. but then there are there's a lot of the times where they don't realize asking that alone can be very othering you know and I think that's the tricky thing with microaggression really is that we uh, it hasn't been really a topic we talked about until the past I would say decade maybe even less. Um, and it's a lot of nuanced language that we don't kind of pick up on until now. And especially with the like, you know, the upspurt of like, like racial aggression. And, uh, and I say upspurt in terms of the fact that we've just seen much more news, news about it. I think we've been, there's been a lot of racial aggression for quite some time, but we just never really talked about it to this sense uh, because of social media and stuff like that. Um, but that being said, like, you know, this other one, my favorite one, which I'm sure you probably get as well, Snow, is like, oh, uh, say happy birthday in your home language or your native tongue. And I'm like, or just say birthday? say something in, 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 a, in a language. Right. It's like just the assumption that, you know, another language and that yeah. they're assuming that that's the language you speak. Correct. Yeah. Um, and so. I, I think we, and you can also like, even like I would, I, the thing I, I would tell people is like, look at some of the movies from the nineties and you can already tell just a lot of the microaggressions and a lot of the word and the things they said just don't carry well to now. That's how much like language has evolved over time. Uh, which again, I'm, I'm not a linguist by any stance and I, this is just me from an observational standpoint. I want everyone to know that this is not my expertise. So it's much more from experience standpoint. So. Yeah, I think those are all very good points. But, you know, I, I think it takes people just realizing that the things they say or ask to people of color can come off more harmful than people intend mm. or realize. It's all about impact versus intention. And you mm -hmm. may not intend it, but that may not be the impact you end up having. You might have a, a harmful impact without realizing just by saying the things you say or asking the things mm. you ask, right? 
So I think those were very good discussions there. So if you, so I would say, especially because we just brought it up, um, if somebody wants to know your ethnic background, what would be an alternative that they could word it to not come off offensive? Um, simply saying that, I think one of the first things is just like, you know, if you truly are curious and you're approaching someone and you are just like, and I think one of the first things is like, hey, I'm I'm just legitimately curious. This has nothing. Uh, it's just I want to know your background because I want to get to know you. Um, what is your what is your ethnic background? And I think putting putting that those first two sentences make a huge world of difference to me because it tells me like because I'm not I'm not going to be mad if you're curious, right? That's just stupid. Uh, but if you're gonna if you are gonna come up and ask me in a in a way that makes me understand that you're not coming to as I call it, like I said, put you into a box. Okay with that. And I think that stating, stating, prefacing that those first two power sentences can make a world of a difference when I talk to you. So, and I, I'm open to hear your thoughts on it as well. Snow, sorry. It's not just me. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I think that like, I mean, I get it as a streamer, right? Um, people come into the chat and I think it's a little different on Twitch because it is an international platform. So mm -hmm. asking a question like, where are you from? Isn't necessarily as... It doesn't seem to carry the same nuance that someone just, you know, at the grocery store asking me, for example, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, here in the U.S., we're American citizens. And when people ask that, it's very othering. But on Twitch, I still get that. And I, when I first got that question, just as a streamer, uh, I try not to take it the way that I would take it if I was asked that here in the U.S., like out, out and about in the grocery store or wherever, and, um, but I will say, I've told, I've talked about this on chat before, but I think wording it like, you know, um, what is your ethnic background or just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I've been a little bit, I, I still don't like the question, but I also mm -hmm. feel like I don't mind it as much as I would if somebody like, you know, at the store or at the post office asked me that. Well, again, it's like one of those things like you think about it. It's just like, for example, um, you know, on Twitch, for example, when I'm streaming, someone asks me that, um, you know, in my head, my first thought is like, well, what is, difference does it make if I tell you if I'm Chinese or not? Is that going to mm -hmm. affect your experience on my Twitch channel? Um, also, like one of the many ones I get is, hey, are you gay? And you know, I'm sitting here going like, please read the gosh darn tags. <laughs> um, the, the second thing is just like, I, I, what, what difference does that make? I'm literally talking about science here. Is me being gay going to affect your information processing? Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, I'm proud that I'm gay, but it's like, I, it, it yeah, should I, not no, be I get your point. Like, why do people put so much emphasis on it when it's not something that's necessarily relevant to what you're all talking about anyway, right? Or what you're doing in general. So mm -hmm. I think it's something to keep in mind because people have to realize when you're on Twitch, when you're on the internet, there are people with feelings, including streamers, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to consider that. And um, Bash was asking here, is there a way to ask where you're from without... Wait, well, when you're trying to figure out where someone lives, so it won't get them taken as asking for ethnic background. Well, that depends on what the context of the question is, right? Like, are you trying to deliver something for them? Or like, are you trying to understand where they're currently at? Or uh, where they grew up, where they grew up at? Uh, I think one of the many stronger things too, as well, is sharing your experience as well. Like one of the, I, I find many times that like, when I, when I put the impetus on, myself and i talk to other folks i'm like oh hey you know like uh and this is again the context and reading the room right like i go up to someone and i'm like we're discussing where we grew up and i was like oh you know like i grew up in virginia and you know uh, born and raised in virginia blah 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 you know and everything like that you find that people end up talking about their background as well um and again it's one of those things that like thinking about what your reasoning for the question is are you truly trying to figure out where they're where but one you shouldn't be a stalker or anything like that i'm not trying to prove that but you know you should think about what your impetus for asking those questions are and um is it going to affect your conversation in general and if not then put yourself out first um as an as especially for people who are not minorities um 
or in the minority group, so the white, so if you're white, um, that it's easier for the conversation to flow if you kind of started out as well. Um, so, and it's, I think that's a very powerful way to do it. Yeah, I really like that suggestion. That's that's what I would plus one to that suggestion because I think <laughs> no, it really it really helps. I think not only that, mm -hmm. but it kind of fuels conversation versus mm -hmm. coming off kind of interrogation style, like where are you Absolutely. from, where you live. You know, it's very like <laughs> I guess it makes it more yeah. comfortable if somebody's like, oh hey, here's a little bit about me. I want to know about you too, right? Yeah, absolutely, and uh, I think that it speaks more world of a difference uh on many of that aspect um i'll say that where i grew up at which was is virginia we had a neighbor who um one of the sweetest people ever um they were you know white as white can be <laughs> um uh, our military family but they were absolutely the kindest to my family because every time they talked to them it wasn't like I'm talking to my Chinese neighbors or I'm talking. They were like, oh, hey, so-and-so, which is my mother. And uh, how is everything going? And blah, blah, blah. Oh, um, I heard the Chinese New Year's. Happy Chinese New Year. I think that's the right way to say it. Please correct me. And they were very conscientious about what they were saying. And this is before we even talked about my progression and all this stuff. Um, and I take that to heart with me when I see a lot of interactions um, going forward. Um, and, you know, I think one of the... And, one of the, the power of just stating to people that you are legitimately trying to learn and that you are want you want to better communicate with them uh and that's one of the first things that anyone will tell you is really to kind of address microaggression is be open uh be open to criticism uh be open to the fact that you're willing to learn from uh you know communication mishaps they're not mistakes they're communication mishaps and think about what you can do better as a person to communicate with other folks Oh, I really like that. Actually, that goes into our next question here that was submitted by the okay. form from Fish866. He asked, what are some good ways to interact or converse with people who don't believe in microaggressions or covert racism, i.e. people who say racism is only when people say, I hate insert race here, quote unquote, or quote unquote, I attacked this person because I hate their race, end quote. So yeah, that, I so, think that that goes into it, right? Right? This is this kind of communicating that you're willing to learn, you're already being considerate, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the big thing. What would you say, Doctor Neuro? So this is a tough question because when you think about, um, so there is direct racism, and then there are the microaggression aspects of it. So I think one of the first things to do is acknowledge the fact that there, yes, there is direct racism. There's that, that's not incorrect. Um, but that racism exists in a spectrum. That's the first thing that we want to talk to people about. So it's not necessarily like, I hate Chinese. Like, I hate those Chinese folks every time. Uh, it can be anything like uh, where you start promoting stereotypes or anything like that, which, uh, again, they're not uniform or they're not, in this case, like, apply to everyone. Um, and thinking about this for aspects of throwing it back to people who don't believe in microaggression and putting that microaggression on them, uh, or at least giving them examples of it really helps, gives them an idea. For example, like if I were to say that like, oh, well, if you're white, um, you must go to church every Sunday or you're white. So you must be, um, so you probably really don't believe, don't really spice up your food. Or, <laughs> you know, like there's like different things you can like, you can like articulate and not this is not me telling you to like go out and microaggress people but it's just like really just kind of um demonstrating that there is microaggression in other groups as well and i don't want to tell everyone that it's just in minorities we can like there's microaggressions towards uh females microaggression towards whites and there's a micro there's it exists in all spectrum so for us to really kind of get to the same level is one not downtrodding on their reasoning, but also just showing by example that this is kind of where microaggression applies to you. And this is and by proxy that this is something that you probably are uh, really inflicting on us. Um, and once again, getting back to the idea that microaggression is not necessarily about direct attacks, it's about the feelings of people who uh, hear these things. Uh, and it's not them to decide whether if it hurts them or not. Like it's like if I were to you know, commit microaggression against Snow, I'm not here to dictate to Snow that she's not a victim of microaggression. 
no one no one should dictate the feelings of a victim in any situation and i think we need to reiterate that fact constantly oh yeah for sure i i definitely think that uh, especially in light of anti-asian hate um just culturally speaking uh, i mean first off asian in general encompasses over a hundred different ethnicities over 50 languages right but a, a very common theme within these cultures is keeping your head down and not speaking up, not challenging authority, right? Yep. And so that's why a lot of these seem like, at least with the anti-Asian hate, is it almost seems sudden because we haven't really talked about it, right? Especially mm -hmm. on such a um, overt national level. And so some people are like, oh, there's no way this is happening. Why, did, why do people only speak up now, right? And then people have had that kind of... Uh, mentality about it because you know we haven't spoken up right before mm -hmm. now but it has been happening it continues to happen but because of the way a lot of us were brought up within these cultures and different ethnicities we keep our head down we don't talk about it we don't challenge it we don't question it when somebody you know does these microaggressions or says says these things to us and I think uh, with everything going on and this kind of racial reckoning that's been happening, I think it's important to realize that uh, this is happening. Validate, you know, everybody that has come forward and spoken up, validate their feelings and learn. I think the biggest thing that I've been pushing is that all of us can learn. No matter who you are, no matter what stage in life you're in, how old you are, all of us are capable of learning and we can do better and be better. And I think learning about microaggressions and listening to victims, listening to people, sharing how they're, they're feeling and their experiences, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. So. Absolutely. But yeah, Absolutely. hopefully that helps answer that particular question. But this is really good because I think, um, especially when it comes to talks about racism in general, a lot of people don't realize there are covert forms of racism. Right. Just mm -hmm. very subtle, but very offensive and harmful in the end. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And the thing is, uh, like racism can exist in a positive slash negative context as well. Right. Like that's again, I want to reinforce the whole model minority. It's a it's a it's a it's a thing that most cultures outside of that sphere will consider as positive. But really, they don't serve anything but to uh, end up causing more issues down the line um, for folks that are dealing with that. So it doesn't bode well um, for anyone who's in there. And I've seen it many a times, like in my undergraduate, high school, graduate, postdoc, and all sorts of stuff, like it, it's just there constantly. I still experience it sometimes at work as well. So I don't know. Yeah, well, just the fact that it's it's so pervasive, right? Like in all mm -hmm. aspects of society, it's not just in school. I think school is a good place to start with education and things like that. But even in our day to day, you know, we're all adults and we're seeing this from other adults, this kind of treatment, these things that people are saying. So it's it's so pervasive. And I think the first step is realizing that these microaggressions exist, being mindful and cognizant of them and then applying that to how you interact with people of color. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the lesson to take from this. But our next question here is from No Cash, who asked, it's hard to judge because media can be ridiculous, but how worried should we be about Asian hate crimes? Um, so speaking as an Asian American, uh, we should, uh, I should be worried, absolutely. I think as American, as an American, um, we should all be worried. I don't know if like extreme worry. I never think extreme worry is productive. Uh, I think worry, productive worry <laughs> is a better way to put it. But the thing is, is that we should be worried um, about it, especially since, you know, how, and Snow, I know you touched on this many a times, like as soon as like the next crisis or something hits, it becomes the next, the last crisis becomes like, no one talks about it anymore. Like no one talks about anti-Asian sentiment and it's not like it disappeared. It's still there. Um, you know, there's still, you know, a lot of anti-Asian crimes that are happening, um, all over the United States, um, they haven't disappeared, uh, but it's not the trending news topic right now. Um, so, but watch what happens and I'm, I'm knocking on wood here that if something 
horrific happens, like another mass shooting with Asian Americans as victims, watch how quickly it'll suddenly spring up and everyone's like, oh my God, we should be worried about this. And I'm like, no, we should never have stopped worrying. We should never have stopped worrying. Um, and we get into this, uh, especially with the United States uh, and I know other countries. So I know people try to correct me and say, well, Europe is concerned. Yes, I understand that. But uh, for the context of Americans, we should very much always be concerned about a lot of these ethnic crimes because uh, they don't go away. Um, you can change the hearts and minds of everyone at once. Uh, that's that's always been the challenge of everyone. Um, and keeping things in the news loop is very hard. And I know, Snow, you, you've pleaded to your community many times to always be educated uh, about these and always like to make sure that you're still talking about it. Um, as soon as we stop talking about certain topics uh, like these, uh, they win. I don't like to put it as like a win win a win or lose situation, but that's when that's when racism wins is when we stop talking about it. And, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, we're still talking about it. Uh, Anti-Asian, we haven't been talking about it as much. It's not the trending topic right now. Um, and we've been predisposed to that, unfortunately. Um, so should we be worried? Absolutely. Um, but should we be really worried? Uh, should we be like severely worried? No, I don't know. I don't think it's that's productive. But I think that for us, we really need to be uh, continuously putting that worry into something productive in terms of talking about it and really making sure that um, we express our concerns. We express our, um, you know, the heavy weight on our heart to make sure that it doesn't go forward like this continuously. So, yeah, I think um, social media plays a really big part of this because like you mm -hmm. mentioned, because if it's not hashtag trending, people just forget. It's very much a out of sight, out of mind kind of thing because of social yeah. media. And that's why I feel like it's even more important to continue to talk about it, like Dr. Nero said, because the moment we stop, people brush this under the rug. They forget, conveniently just kind of move on. And then the next tragedy happens, right? And then this comes back up, right back to the surface. And we get nowhere because we stop talking about it, right? So, um, you know, I, I think it's just really important to continue to educate yourself. And I agree about not, like, worrying to the point where you're not productive. Because mm -hmm. I do agree with that. Like, yes, I think we should worry, but we should channel that energy into making a difference where you can, right? Ex mm -hmm. Like reevaluate your personal bubbles, reevaluate your personal circles, you know, at school, at work, right? Within your friendship circles. And if you mm -hmm. see something that you could address personally, like if you have a friend who makes a quote unquote racist joke and plays it off like a joke, speak up. Right. Even even especially when you have people who may not be able to speak up uh, themselves, but they are targeted. Right. Like there's been a few cases where I've heard Asian jokes, racist jokes, and I didn't speak up. And I don't think that's necessarily my fault, but it's one of those cases where, you know, when you're a victim going through these things, it's already hard enough processing that you're kind of being attacked, really. Right. And, and having to try to stand up to the people who to your aggressors or to your, you know, whoever's abusing or speaking those kind of things to you. Right. That's already really tough for a lot of these people. And so yeah. seeing someone who may not be in that marginalized group speak up in support and say, hey, don't say that. You know, I think that's that's just really important to consider. Right. Because. Mm -hmm. Again, the moment you stop talking about it, the moment you stop, you know, reading about it, learning about it is where, you know, we all go back. We end up taking a few steps back, essentially, and no progress is really made. Yeah. So. Absolutely. So. That kind of goes into uh, our, okay. our next question, actually. I just realized sure. this is kind of a redundant question. <laughs> but Calista no. was asking, why has the media not covered more? of the increase of violent attacks against AAPI people. Uh, I feel like with how much BLM dominated the media news cycle, this would have gained much more traction. I think you touched on this a little, right? It's, I mean, we've, we've seen this with the news cycle. I mean, like, let's say, for example, I'm going to take a recent example here. Trump, uh, he dominated the news cycle constantly. There was a lot of stuff going around, going on with the world. 
and uh, a lot of things just got shuffled under. And I'll tell you right now that that was essentially his uh, his administration's tactic. Really, it was just like keep him on top of the news cycle, and everything else that was going on was basically swept under the rug. Um, that 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 was it, and it worked. It worked fabulously because you saw how many times people didn't really talk about it. Not to say that this is a this is the kind of the emphasis uh, emphasis here, but it's just unfortunately with the way that we digest news and we digest information right now, it's very hard for us to talk about several important subjects at once. We're just not we're not prone to doing that. And for example, I mean, example too, it's like I you know we just started what is it the congressional um, update on Snow's channel where I post daily updates, almost daily updates on what's going on in Congress, what are we doing, what are hip bills are being produced and all sort of stuff. And people were, people just didn't have the energy to really digest that type of stuff. Um, and so I think that part of it really kind of feel, fuels into these discussions. And I've, said, I've seen many people who really do care about, you know, AAPI, but they're just, they're, they just don't have the mental capacity to digest that news uh, constantly. And it's, not to say that, and I say this as someone who is in an AAPI group, is I don't ever want someone to feel like they're constantly being mentally berated for not talking about, for not ingesting this news constantly. It's very hard uh, to deal with that. And so um, I think we need to be conscientious, too, of mental bandwidth of people when we talk about these subjects um, many a times. We, we're very, we need to be much kinder to ourselves on that aspect. Uh, that being said, um, we shouldn't forget the situations that are happening. Um, but, you know, we, that's part of the, like, when we go, when we talk to people about it, it's like, we need to ask their permission too. It's like, do you have the bandwidth to talk about this? Or do you have the bandwidth to really have a discussion on this? And sometimes people don't, and that's fine. Uh, that's kind of the whole mental health aspects, right? We don't, you know, if like, if we're gonna talk to people who are not willing to listen or just don't have the mental capacity to, you might as well just talk to a wall. Um, it's not productive and it's not going to be, it's not good for your energy as well. So, um, so think about it from that perspective. So, yeah, I think that's a really good point, which I kind of found out the hard way because, you know, especially after the Atlanta shootings, I kind of dove headfirst into activism, which is something that was kind of new to me. And I, mm -hmm. I'm pretty much burned myself out. And I think that is something that applies not only to people who are being activists, but also to people consuming, you know, uh, information and news and everything about these issues. And yep. I've been trying to, I'm still working on balancing it, you know, and I do think it's very important to keep talking about it. I mean, I'm still working sure. on reading what I can, updating my resource list that I created a, a few months or a few weeks ago. And... Yep. Um, but I agree that I think it's it's about balancing it so that people get reminded of it constantly without being overwhelmed, right? Yep. I think that's the big part. And I'm hoping that media outlets are continuing to cover. Um, I, I've only been following a couple um, news sites in terms of their coverage, but they, some news media outlets do have dedicated like Asian America sections and reporting by AAPI uh, reporters and journalists. So mm -hmm. those people are still talking about it. But I don't know about other bigger media outlets like CNN or um, Washington Post. I don't know. I mean, right now, half the world is... <laughs> I yeah. say this as someone who works... I mean, like, I get briefed on... Like, every morning, I'll tell you guys right now, I get briefed on what's going on with the rest of the world. Uh, to give you a snapshot, India's India's having a catastrophic failure with like their health system based on COVID. Um, right now, uh, Bangladeshi government is having to deal with a lot of Rohingya pass uh, refugee populations and trying to figure out where the home they're, they're going to put them in. Uh, there's still contentions with Taiwan and Hong Kong and China. Uh, there is a whole discussion about the Olympics in Tokyo because of their rising cases. Brazil is having a catastrophic failure as well. Uh, based on their COVID cases, with Bolsonaro being the head of the lead. Ethiopia right now is under a crisis situation from all the refugees that are fleeing it. Like, this is just the tip of the iceberg of situations that are going on with the rest of the world. And that's, you know, it's it's very hard to, like, talk about every important subject because it's not for me to tell anyone that's like, well, AAPI issues should be the 
only thing we should talk about. I'm like, well, that's not true. Like, there's a lot of other situations of crisis that are going on with the rest of the world, but we need to be, um, again, it's one of those things that like, um, we need to be a better about mentally compartmentalizing a lot of these information and not making sure we forget that this is an issue that still happens. Uh, and that means that could just mean something as simple as reading reading up on articles about it from a, on a weekly basis, like make it a point to like, hey, what's going on with AAPI? What's going on with this on a weekly basis? It's once reading something once a week about that can make a world of a difference in terms of making sure you don't forget those subjects. Yeah, I think that's a really good point is that, you know, I, I like that suggestion of just weekly, you know, or every other week, just kind of catching up on what's going on. And, mm -hmm. and of course, being mindful, again, within your personal circles, right, continuing mm -hmm. to be actively against that. So if you hear a coworker making a racist joke or something, speak up, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's really important to, to not continue to let that get brushed under the rug or normalized, right? And that's where a lot of these problems come from is because of situations like that that continue to get perpetuated and normalized and as a result we get tragedies that happen you know that we see on the news because it all starts at the beginning with these things like microaggressions these things like you know people not speaking up for you know peers that are facing this kind of discrimination right mm -hmm. so i think that's important uh our next question here is from vinius he says, I'm Asian. I have my aunt and uncle in East Texas. They're white, and I know they love and care for me and would protect me at, all, at any cost. Should I be fearful of visiting them? Not a fear of them, but a fear of the people around there? I'm in San Francisco. Should I be extra scared or extra cautious just going around the Bay Area based on recent events? It's a very hard question because I'm not going to tell you not to be cautious, but at the same time, I don't want you to feel scared. Um, the, I think one of the many things that we, uh, if you are a citizen that's concerned about this, like um, there are like, take a look in terms of like your local police, like what, what types of crimes have happened recently um and someone mentioned this early which i like as well but it's like always make sure you're not all walking around alone um you know and the thing is is that we there's a lot of targeted populations especially elderly um asians which i think is absolutely despicable but usually elderly individuals that are usually targeted there are the outliers and i didn't realize that um and so part of it is really making sure that if you are concerned uh take steps to make sure you're protected like carrying may spray or, you know, making sure that you let people know where you are at all times, uh, being with people like, you know, in groups or so, or if others, if you can, um, take an Uber if possible, um, and all sort of stuff. Like there are different things you can do as well. And there's been a lot of stuff happening here in Manhattan as well, uh, which is where I'm at. So I think um, making sure that you're, protect you're, you're cautious and protected is the emphasis here. Uh, and I know your relatives, bless their heart, that they are, you know, still care for you and they're, they're not, they're willing to protect you at all costs. Like, feel free to talk to them about it. Like, ask them, like, tell them, like, hey, like, I know that this is going on. Like, should I feel safe and everything else and stuff? And, you know, your relatives who love you should, like, definitely be open to, like, doing their own research in the area, figuring out, like, what's going on, what's happening and um, really making sure that you're protected. I'm not going to sit here and tell you you should be uh, definitely afraid. Uh, I hate fear mongering. Like that's like I, my biggest pet peeve. Um, I, t I would tell you to be cautious. Uh, I would tell you to be vigilant. I would tell you to uh, talk to everyone you can about it on your concerns and make sure that you take uh, necessary precautions that you feel is necessary. If, you, if, it t if it means like doing something extra and above, to make sure you feel comfortable, that's fine. Like your safety is dictated by you. Um, how you feel safe should be dictated by you. No one else can dictate that. Um, if anyone's gonna tell you that like, oh, well that's just going overboard. Well, that's not for them to say, that's for you to decide. So that's the only thing I can offer in terms of advice wise. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think it's always good, especially if you're going out alone to let people know where you are at all times. Right. Mm -hmm. So that way, if you're expected somewhere and you and you're late or you don't show up or something, then they know, right? Somebody knows. Right. And then mm -hmm. secondly, um, I do agree. Definitely talk to your aunt and uncle. You know, you said that that 
they they would love and care for you, right? But do they know your feelings? Do they know your mm-hmm. experiences? Do they know how what you're going through? And I think because right. you know they're your relatives, they care about you, you care about them. I think it's only fair to talk to them about it and to hope that they will understand, you know, and I think uh, talking about it in general is a big part of it. Um, yeah. Again, letting people know where you are at all times. And um, yeah, I agree with Absolutely. all that. So, I mean, I personally ended up buying pepper spray and a stun gun, which is allowed under Colorado law uh, to carry mm-hmm. around. So I, that was my response to to this whole thing, right? To this heightened fear and anxiety. And um, I wouldn't say that it's completely gone away because of that, but it does help me, you know, as Dr. Nero said, dictate my own safety, right? To protect myself, to feel like I at least have a chance in case anything happens, right? Um, And to be prepared, just to be watchful and prepared. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, I don't think paranoia is a good good solution in general, but... No, and I and I think that I, I think we need to replace paranoia with just like extra caution. Really, um, there are. Uh, by the way, also also for anyone like there are apps on your phone that you can download that you can do to help. If like uh, there's one I remember, and I don't know what the state of it has been since I last checked on it, where uh, you can press on it if you feel you're in danger. And what it does is that like is if you let it go, and after a certain amount of time, it automatically calls the police, and they're and they're immediately sent to your location that you're at. Um, I'll have to get the name of it and send it to Snow, but it's very it's very cool app um, to help promote safety. And it was also it was originally uh, made for women who uh, who went or were out alone at night. They felt unsafe that you can use those apps to do that. Um, so there are different there are technology solutions that are out there that I would suggest you uh, we could take a look at as well. That actually reminds me, I just thought about it. Um, I've been sharing this, and I don't know how many people have looked into it, but there is um, bystander intervention training. That is a thing. Because mm-hmm. in a lot of these situations, especially what we're seeing on the news in, in, uh, in terms of anti-Asian hate and the incidents happening, there's usually a lot of people who just kind of watch it happen. And yeah. they don't intervene. They don't do anything to stop it. And I think it's because a lot of people are afraid that they're going to get hurt or or in you know worse in some cases and so there is i understand the fear with that right but i think Mm -hmm. it's also a lot of cases people just don't know what they can do because there are ways you can help without directly putting yourself between the victim and the aggressor and i think that's really important to know there is this holler it's called holla back intervention training bystander intervention training um, it is in my AAPI resource list. So if you're interested in that, it's free. You don't have to pay for it. It's a one-hour session that you can just basically join a bunch of other people learning how to be a better bystander. So that is yep. one way to help. So, Great. Uh, our next question here is from Twining Vines, who asked, with the passage of the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, what's the best way we, as bystanders, help ensure that the fight continues and that people don't think that the end of COVID slash the passage of this act means the end of racism? It's a fantastic question. Um, So passing an act does not mean it stops everything. I agree. Uh, This is one of the biggest things I can't stand. (laughs) We talk about like legislative acts and everything. Legislative acts are only effective if we enforce them. Uh, keeping your local representatives and your local law enforcement, or if they are, you know, if their leadership is willing, um, and all this stuff is a critical for your discussion wise. Um, you know, I, I tell people that one of the best things you can do from the political perspective or just activism is not just addressing from the congressional standpoint, but it's actually local, like your district attorney, your local mayor, your, your governor, all these other things. All those folks should be the ones that you should be um, really uh, focusing in on to ensure that uh, even with the passage of those act, that they that those people are adhering and enforcing, um, you know, sustainable solutions to help um, AAPI groups or just in general, the COVID-19 Hate Ninth Crimes Act. Second thing is the fact that read the act. Uh, really read the act and see what constitutes under there and what protections are under there. 
Um, because one of the many things I tell people is uh, lack of information is one of the biggest fallacies with like uh, activist act, uh, activism. Um, if you don't have the information, if your act, you know, your activist activities don't mean daily squat. Um, so really read up on act, really understand what it is that you're protecting and also look for ways that you can improve upon that. Remember, these acts aren't set in stone We're, you know, we can always look away for ways to improve that as well. So um, it's best to kind of think of it that way and make sure that uh, one, those dialogue continue to happen from the Senate and from the House perspective, but also that you're ensuring to make sure your local leaders are held accountable for that. Um, if something is happening and you're, you realize that, let's say, um, let's say, let's take example for me, like if I notice that New York City, something's not happening, like there's like a lot, the hate, Asian hate crimes have gone up as a result of it. Um, you sure as hell bet that I will write a nasty ass letter, no, I'm, I'm like a productive letter to uh, the governor and to the mayor uh, to really be like, what is going on like this is like this is something that uh you are not doing x y and z to protect us you're not uh you're not putting resources in communities you're not doing these like that is absolutely critical for you to ensure that because federally we can only do so much federally we can establish the framework but how you decide to make it something uh, actually actable is how you as a community, and I say you as community, sorry, not just the individual, as a community pull together to ensure that uh, whatever community you're in is like, held accountable to all these actions. Yeah, I like that. I think it's, um, especially when it comes to things like legislation, it can feel very like one and done if people don't stay yeah. informed, right? and follow up and see what, what local leaders are doing to, you know, help in the situation. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really good point in general, but I don't have mm -hmm. anything else to add to that. But yeah, that's a, sure. I think that's a really good question too, because um, I think for a lot of us, we, you know, hear about these legislations or these, you know, bills and things that get proposed and I would hope that people are reading up on it. I know I usually look at it and make sure I tell people, you know, this is a link to the actual bill. You can see all the, you know, what's included, any proposed amendments, mm -hmm. things like that. And I do, I, I've been encouraging people to read that. I don't know if people are not bothering or I know some people are, but I feel like it's it's very, I don't know. How do you get people to look into that and to really kind of motivate them to, be interested, right? Because I feel like when, especially when it comes to reading about all these different acts, there's a lot of legislation out there, right? And mm -hmm. I, I think it can be hard for the average person to get motivated, right? To do this, to reach out to yeah. local leaders and ask what they're doing. What would you suggest? It's a good question. I think um, from this perspective, uh, this is where your activists, like, acti like activists really can come in. Um, I always want to say Activision. <laughs> I'm like, it's an Activision. Um, but I think one of the many things we can do as individuals is um, who are kind of deep into a lot of this stuff is uh, this is where you can take that information and see if you can find ways to distill like a Cliff Notes version of like, hey, this is the, this act just passed. These are some of the critical components here. Um, and this is the reason why, like, this is kind of like what I've been doing with a lot of COVID stuff is uh, there's like so much information coming out, like, and how much all the stuff is coming out. People are getting confused. People are getting misinformed and all sorts of stuff. So what I do is I synthesize and I take all the information and I create my, I put it on my own, on myself to create those information uh, ways that people can digest it. Um, understanding that people who don't want to read it, like just passively reading it, like just, you know, quick, like, oh, here's like a two, three tweet thread of what's going on with this act and why it's important give give me the summary version of it that's how people digest certain information especially people who aren't like you know legislative heavy or like savvy it's understandable like we're not it's not like we're taught how to read it uh and doing that and really breaking it down and sharing it and encouraging sharing that information uh, is actually, I find one of the most powerful tools that you can do to really encourage people to uh, think about and talk about those situations. So, yeah, I really like that. Perfect. Um, this is actually, I think, our last question on the Stop Asian Hate and Anti Asian Racism. 
Okay. Um, so let's dive into that. This is actually from me. What is the most effective way to reach out to our U.S. senators about legislation and issues that we care about? How should we word or express our concerns in the most impactful way to U.S. senators? Should we be brief? Should we give details? There's a, that's a very, I love that question because it's one of the many things I get to constantly get stuff about. Um, so several key things to think about this is um, uh, there are templates that are out there um, and there's not one that I really particularly like. Uh, I think um, AACP has one, but in general, like here's some of the guidelines I would say, uh, keep it to one page. Um, I can tell you right now that people who it's not going to be the the person the senator themselves reading it it's usually legal aides uh or any of the aides of these like uh, folks who actually go through all this what they do is like they address their job completely is sitting here sifting through piles and piles and piles of like letters to the senators and the representatives so it's the first thing um two getting educated about their voting records and like what their priorities are as uh, senators or representatives. You can actually see their voting records on, um, I can't remember, it was like Congress, like congressional, like vote.org or something like that. But you can actually find out their voting records and what they what they care about um, because you want to be able to speak to them, even if it's a senator or someone you don't like. Uh, and I tell people to put that aside, especially when you talk to folks. Like, let's say, for example, we're writing to Ted Cruz, okay? Our focus, his, his, he's a very interesting individual, uh, but he's very focused on fiscal conservatism and he's very much on certain like, you know, uh, international policies. If you actually read, he's actually very big in a lot of foreign policy stuff as well. Um, so for us really is making sure that we are educated about kind of their, what the track record is. And third, we're not here to berate them. Don't don't ever write it in a way that sounds like you're writing a hate letter to them. I can tell you that gets immediately thrown away or they just discard it. Uh, come in with very much it's like respectable, uh, you know, you know, and that's what you'll start off with respectable Senator Cruz. Um, I, I want to bring up to you this discussion of um, this act or legislative or whatever that's being brought forward. Um, and really make it personal as well because you want to be able to say that like why does this impact you as a citizen uh it doesn't matter if you talk like in general like uh you want to talk about it in the sense of like oh well this is impacting me because of you know let, let's say that asian crime Asian, you know that COVID 19 hate crime you know like i've seen in my community a rise in you know asian hate crimes and i see that this is something that uh and it, it worries me as a citizen um for my safety and all sorts of stuff bring it back home always to in your letter to them um and you, you'll see a lot of application apps and things like that are out there that will try to write a quick letter that just speaks you know spits it out i can tell you that those don't do anything they'll just throw those away or what will happen is that sometimes what senators will do is they'll have a canned email that they'll just send out on mass uh or send it you know paper mail to you that's snail mail that really is just them saying like oh yeah it's important we know we see it um sometimes you will get that even with like the most heartfelt letters so um but and obviously make sure you introduce yourself too. like you know my name is blah 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 i'm in this district i'm, I'm doing this about whatever you need to to help kind of personalize that letter um but really one of the key things like i said is making sure that you are knowledgeable about the act that you're talking about or the uh the legal aspects of it uh, or just like the high levels this doesn't even have to be like intricate and really kind of mapping it back to your own personal experience what do you do? how does it affect you what do you what does it mean to you as a as a citizen and the fact that and and really making sure you implore to them as a senator you have the capacity and power to make a difference in this uh and like i said even if it's a senator or a representative or someone that you loathe uh, <laughs> or someone that has not had the best track record of your thing never ever approach them in a way that's like you know attacking them um it never does anyone any good in terms of like when you want to do this type of work unless if you're like a large organization that has the pull and power you you as a citizen the reality check is that you're probably not going to really ring a bell under your ear it's not like like if like for example if i were to write to um senator cruz right now he'd probably be like 
and attack him, he'd probably just shrug and be like, okay, <laughs> what is this one person going to do? Um, and so I think that's the best way to kind of approach it to uh, really keep it level-headed, really make sure you bring the facts and statements, uh, do your research, really. Like, again, this couple always comes back to making sure you do your research. Uh, don't come in with, like, anecdotal stories although you could start off with that but like bring some statistics bring some uh data bring some you know hey here's some stuff that i've read up on and they're like this is what's going on um and when when you bring that it's kind of hard for them to kind of refute that or for them to really come back and say oh well you're just being hysterical or you're not you're not being serious or not when you do that it's them taking it seriously so it's kind of been like my general suggestion for writing to these um aids as well one page <laughs> yeah one page good 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 i like that i think it's it's uh, for a lot of us we don't have that experience of reaching out to uh, our legislators you know that's not something mm -hmm. they really teach in school obviously you know and and i think it's a lot of us don't know how and i think for a lot of people you know like you said especially if they don't like a particular senator or legislator they you know it's it's difficult for some people to separate their their feelings from writing out something to get change done right yeah so absolutely very very important all righty so we are moving now into the covid pandemic vaccine etc questions uh, i do want to remind everybody out there don't forget if you have anything you want to chip into the conversation if you have any questions that you think of while we're discussing please don't hesitate to ask we are reading chat and we will address your questions if you have something that comes out of what we're talking about all right mm -hmm. so but yeah thank you dr neuro for your insight on all of that sure our next our first question here uh comes from several people i think we had a few repeated questions here but from myself uh calesta and noel cash what are your thoughts on the blood clots from the johnson and johnson vaccine is this something we should be concerned about? What's the risk? Sure. That's a good question to start off with because that just recently happened. Uh, just to kind of give you guys a brief context, and I want to make sure. It's, I always provide brief context just to help shape the talk. Um, so about several weeks ago, we recently, there was reports um, from the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, um, which is the database that's really held by CDC to kind of have citizens to report uh, any severe side effects or situations that happen as a result of the vaccines. And what we noticed was that there was a higher proportion of folks that were reporting uh, blood clots, or what we call thrombotic events, um, in a lot of the population that were under 50. Um, that being said, so, the, so, they, so this was already under the auspices, unfortunately, of the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, which utilizes the same technology as uh, the Johnson & Johnson, so just to kind of let people know, which is called the adenovirus vector vaccine. Uh, we'll go into a little bit detail as to like how that works and everything if people are curious. Um, so because of that, uh, the FDA and CDC and NIH and all the groups decided to make a uniform decision to pause that um, to evaluate and take a look at the data and really understand what might be the currents or what might be the situation here uh, for that. What we ended up finding was that, um, and this is kind of like jumping it forward a little bit, um, this is after the pause and everything, we found out that it was about 15 patients uh, for women under 50 uh, that all had um, this strange type of blood clot event. It wasn't just any blood clot event. Um, it was what we call thromb uh, thrombocytopenia uh, thrombotic event. And it was essentially like uh, a situation where it was a very rare blood, a blood clot type. And I'm, just, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but if people want to, I'm happy to go into that. Um, and we were trying to investigate what might have been the triggering point of this. So what we realized actually, um, well, one, we don't have a full understanding of the me mechanisms behind it. We have hypothesis of it. Um, and that, but there are ways to detect it. Uh, we found that there are different ways that we can help, we can inform clinicians to how to test it uh, based on certain at-risk groups and all sort of stuff. Um, so what ended up happening is that at the end, FDA and all the groups decided that to release the pause and say, you know what, as long as we communicate the risks of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which by the way, is still very rare, it's 15 adverse events out of seven to 8 million doses administered. So someone 
calculate that percentage for me and tell me how rare that is. Um, that being said, um, for women who are under 50 who are getting the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you should be like the person who's going to give it to you should be communicating to you the risk of like, this is the stuff that could possibly happen. It's very, very rare. But if something does happen um, based on certain symptoms that you should go to your doctor uh, and let them know, hey, I just had a Johnson & Johnson vaccine this about this time and you know, let them know. And what they could do is run certain tests to figure out if you might be at risk at that certain type of blood clot. Um, so again, I want to stress the fact that it's super rare. It's very, very rare. Um, and so one of the things we want to make sure is that we're informing the public about it. But it's important that we also keep the J&J &J vaccine in circulation because the one shot vaccine, also, it's very easy to transport, is critical for reaching like at risk populations and for groups who don't normally have access, like incarcerated people or homeless people. Like they're not going to be the ones that you can go and say, oh, well, come back here in three weeks and uh, get your second shot of the Pfizer vaccine. It's very hard. So um so that's kind of a challenge, but you know, but that's the reason for the first pause to Calista, uh, your point. So that first pause was then making sure that we were make, that we were aware of what was going on, that we have something to address this issue, and that we have better understanding of what to move forward. Uh, again, I want to stress also the point that we don't hundred percent know the full me mechanics of what causes these these blood clots, uh, but there are people who are still investigating that right now in parallel. But again. Keep in mind the fact that this is something that we can look into. This is something we can diagnose. This is something we can treat as well. So that's one of the that's one of the many things that we have to think about when we talk when we talk about adverse events. Is uh, is this something that's treatable? Is this something that we can detect? And we did. So I had a question um, for the the what is it? Fifteen people that got the blood clots. Did, did this mm -hmm. happen a certain amount of time after getting the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, or it wasn't within that first fifteen thirty minutes, right? No, and that's a fan. That's I am so glad you asked that question. That's a great question. So within so these usually events they they've they've seen um, happen precipitated around two weeks or so. So that's why they said like if it's like after three weeks after you've got the vaccine, two to three weeks past that, you should be okay. Um, one of the many things that they notice is a common denominator, which is very hard to say, is uh, headaches, uh, persistent uh, headaches after you've gotten the vaccine. So, and I say this is like a difficult thing is because a lot of people get headaches many a times, but uh, for, that's why I have to say that for women under 50, uh, if you do get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that if there is a nasty persistent headache that continues for the first two weeks or so you should probably talk to a doctor and let them know that hey i did get the johnson and johnson vaccine and i am more concerned about it and let them know and they'll decide whether they could do what the next steps are okay very good um mm -hmm. valzers was asking that's a good question were there any similarities in the circumstances of them getting clots were there pre-existing like health con health issues or anything with these women do you know no, there, that's another good question. There is never consistency. The only thing that we found was consistent was uh, their age group. Uh, that was really the only consistent factor. We checked uh, women who were taking oral contraceptives. Um, so that is one big factor that could probably relate to blood clots because if any women who are in chat, uh, that's one if who has taken oral contraceptives, that's one of the big risks they'll tell you. Uh, we asked if anyone um, had any pre-existing, uh, you know, history of blood clots or anything, and none of them have had that. So there's a lot that we were assuming that might have been the case, but we ended up did not have, we did not see. And it's also the same for the AstraZeneca vaccine as well. So uh, that's what makes this diff problem set so difficult. It's a lot of things we were assuming uh, to be might be the trigger point ended up not being the case. So we just don't know. We did get a number here from Pixelated Soul. Uh, what was it? 15 out of 7 million is a 0.000214% chance. Yep. Yep. So almost, very, very low. almost negligible, really. Right? So it's, it's a little negligible. And if you even, if you want to like narrow it down to just um, women who are getting the vaccine, that percentage does go up. So I'm not trying to be. Uh, I want to be clear on that one. But again, that number is still insignificant. Um, 
but it's our responsibility as you know a health agency to inform the public that there is this risk out there. It's actually very irresponsible for us to be like, oh, whatever, don't worry about it. Like you should be, you should be considering that fact because it's for you as educated people to decide if you want to take the vaccine or not. We're never going to tell you should you take. Johnson and Johnson, Pfizer or Moderna or whatever, you decide afterwards. So um, I tell, for example, my sister um, who was looking into the vaccine, uh, she was just like, oh, I'm concerned about the blood clots in my age group. I was like, well, consider maybe the other vaccines as an option. You do have that choice. Um, so that's kind of the many reasons why we held that pause and we wanted to extend that pause is because we want to better understand what the data showed and what those um, what was going on. So. Well, we have a question here from Ooze uh, in chat. Would it be possible to continue using the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for people who are not in the risk group? Or is there a still very small chance that it could happen to those other groups, so not just women under 50? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. It's, we put it back into circulation because we still feel it's still very safe in many aspects. And um, we're very much confident in the fact that, and I say we as in like, and I don't, by the way, to let people know, I don't have sharehold or I don't have invested ventures in any of these companies. I'm very much an outsider, uh, just looking from a scientific perspective. So um, just because I know I get accused of that a lot. <laughs> so I'm a big part of big pharma and I'm like, I wish I was because then I get a big check and I won't have to, <laughs> I was like, I can live in a penthouse in Manhattan. Um, but no, I think one of the many things we started seeing is the fact that the risk profile, um, and there's like a fantastic diagram. And I did a very long thread about the ACIP meeting. You guys can literally read it on my Twitter. Like I detailed every single slide, what was important, what was going on. And we found out that it was just really like the risks were so negligible that uh, for people who are outside of that age group and and, and gender group that it's it's actually irresponsible for us to hold back that vaccine because there was that those 50 cases. So, OK, um, Valsers had a question here. So I don't know how much you know about how the vaccines are being administered in other countries, but Valsers is asking pertaining to the UK. Um, sure. He's about to get his, he's, he's, he's not yet received his first dose. Um, would he have a choice and, and, or do you just get what's given at the time? I don't know if you know about vaccines in other countries right now, what's being given where, uh, I think, you was it the, you sure? I want to say Sorry, it was the, on. the, what is it? AstraZeneca one that's in mm -hmm. Europe, isn't it? Or correct. So it, it could very we well be that there. one. I don't know if Moderna um, and Pfizer are being exported anytime soon. Uh, there are, I mean, there's not like a ton, but there are options available. Um, I can't quote on because I'm not, I've not been like like keyed in on what the UK has been doing, um, as you know, issue wise. Um, you know, so you should have a choice, but I just don't know whether if like they have the mechanisms to actually promote that. Um, and even in the United States, it's a little difficult sometimes. Certain groups are very, like, because we have, like, a wonderful website called vaccinefinder.org, which you can look by specific vaccines um, for certain. I don't know whether the UK or EU has that, something like that. Um, so I think it's best to really, whatever site or place that you decide to visit, that you do contact them to let them know that you do, that if there is something you want to consider as an alternative option as well. Um, that being said, um, you know, I will tell you right now, and I'm being very, and again, I don't have stakeholders in this. I do feel strongly the fact that the AstraZeneca vaccine does work. Um, it's It's been, it, you know, they've had some botch ups with their communication aspects, but it is a vaccine that still works. Um, so if you feel like, you know, you've got the Walmart brand or some off brand <laughs> version because you got yeah. AstraZeneca, that's, that's not the mentality I want people mm -hmm. to think about as well. However, you should be informed as, people here that or patients say you do have there are certain risks associated with those the AstraZeneca and the Johnson and Johnson and that's kind of the challenge that we have here and I know the EMA the European Medical Association just recently uh released a hold on that so I think that we're just trying to take a look into that um as well so okay very good um Sleepy is here asking would blood clot medication be a way to reduce the risk of the blood clot associated with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. He's asking, knowing mm -hmm. that there are risks associated with such medications. 
That's a very great question. And this is one of the trickiest aspects of the fact that for when we look at the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that rare blood clot I was telling you about. So typically blood clots are, are tr typically treated by heparin. Uh, it's an anticoagulant. Uh, it goes in and breaks up that blood clot essentially. Um, however, here's the kicker to this one. This blood clot actually gets worse. This specific one gets worse by that treatment of heparin. Um, and so that's one of the many reasons why we had that pause originally, because we were basically sending out memos to all the doctors in the field saying, hey, if you get a patient that has Johnson & Johnson that has, you know, has these things, make sure you test their blood for this certain uh, factor, what we call platelet factor four. And once you test it, make sure that you don't treat them with heparin. Instead, you treat them with what they call intravenous immunoglobulin, that's that's IVIG, and other either, either like drugs to make sure that you deal with the blood clot. Um, and that's, so there is a treatment aspects of it, but there's nothing that you can do to treat yourself uh, to kind of um, prevent a blood clot from happening. It's more of a kind of a react, more kind of like uh, for you to go talk to a doctor for them to perform the test to make sure that you are at risk for that specific blood clot. So all, all doctors should know not to use the, the we said it's a pepperant. Pepperant, um, yeah. Yeah, so they should know not to use that. So if, if anybody did get a blood clot from a Johnson & Johnson vaccine and they go see a doctor, is there any kind of fear that the doctor may not know or may have missed the memo somehow? There's a very, very small percentage. I'm not going to ever, I don't like working in absolutes. There's always a small percentage, but it's also why I tell people, um, make sure you have those records read, ready, uh, let people know. And if it's still within that window, really tell the doctor that uh, there is something going on. Uh, but again, like, it's one of those things, it's like, if you have that persistent headache that lasts for more than two, three weeks after afterwards, then you probably should go see a doctor about that. Okay. Very good advice. Uh, we're going to do one more question before we take a quick break. Um, sure. But this is our, our next question here. Um, this is from me. I was asking, now that sure. more and more Americans are getting vaccinated, people are probably itching to go back to the quote unquote old normal. What precautions should we be taking? And is it still too risky to be jumping back to the old normal so soon? So I don't. So this is my honest opinion, is I don't think we'll ever get back to that old normal. Um, or at least we won't get back to the old normal, like, very, very soon, right? And I, I say, like, old normal, like, you know, actually, like, having huge congregate setting indoors. Let's So let's say TwitchCon. That's a big that's Yeah, I was going to say, well, conventions? Go. No more conventions? Not for a while for me. Um, so I will tell you right now that... And I've been preaching this consistently, and I've actually received a lot of hate mail for this. Um, I've been blasting like all these conventions, like Dragon Con, uh, San Diego Comic Con one? did something, right? And, yeah, and all these other places. And I was just like, it is not. No one should be having conventions this year. No one. Uh, they're not in position in a way to actually be safe, hundred percent safe, and we should not be promoting that. Um, so that's some side tangent. But the idea is, is that like. Um, what precautions should we be taking? So one of the many things precaution wise is we can do, we can really be better at that vaccinate. We really need to be vaccinating everyone. I can't stress that enough. Uh, vaccinating everyone is, is going to be the first priority. Uh, second is the fact that um, we really need to be uh, much more, we still need to be testing. We still need to be like really what we call genomic surveillance. Like we really need to be sequencing all the virus that's coming out there. Um, out, so we have a better idea of what the heck is going on. If there are other mutations that might occur. Um, third is the fact that we need to be supplying better resources to health agencies in the United States. They're very underfunded. Um, and as you can tell, with like almost near collapse of most of the hospital systems, like we're just not positioned to handle the capacity of that. So we just need to make sure that that resource is there. Uh, four, that we're making sure that we are promoting good messaging across the board, public health and everything. Um, we weren't, we were a little clumsy at the beginning, um, but it was also because we were trying to pick up from the last administration that kind of left us in tatters. But, you know, making sure that uh, misinformation and disinformation are being squashed. Um, that, that's one of the many things that we can do as precautionary measures. And um, I think one of the, and I say this to someone who constantly has to deal with this many a times, it's like, um, 
really be cautious about, you know, any situation or any information that you have and do your research. Or if you don't know, if you don't know, reach out to people like me, um, who's willing to tell you this is the lowdown, this is the papers to support it, this is the research to support it. Um, and, you know, be, be conscientious of that. Um, the final being the fact that like really ensuring that, um, well, one, that we're, we're addressing a worldwide situation here um that because the thing is is that many people say like well you know america first and everything i was like well sure but the problem is is that like if we leave the rest of the world to burn it leaves many opportunities for that virus to continue to mutate and uh do a lot of things that we don't want it to do and also for the fact that it's not it's the world economy and the world like supply chain is very delicate so if one country collapses because of the fact that, some, let's say India, for example, if, that, if India collapses, do you know how much that would actually hurt the rest of the world in terms of, like, let's just think of from the economic perspective. Um, but not even that, like, the Serum Institute of India is one of the largest vaccine producers. We can't have them collapsing under that weight of COVID. So that's one of the many things that I think we can do uh, from that. But once again, I think the key thing to do for many folks who are in here um, really is getting your information and doing doing your best to vet your information and talk with folks about it. Uh, again, if you have the capacity to, if you don't, uh, you know, one of the many things I tell people, like, don't, don't be a reach, a like rabid retweeter. Like you retweet anything that looks that, that sounds like it's sensational or it's like a big thing. I've had to correct so many times to people who have told me like, oh, well, uh, this is miracle drug that's out there that could cure COVID. And I'm like, it's the first I've heard of it. And I'll read it and it's like no quoted research, no nothing, but it, it'll just be some random article from news daily article of Alabama or something like that. And I'm just picking them up one state, but it's just like, you know, it, I find that that usually ends up being something that hurts a lot of communities more is dealing with that misinformation, disinformation. Um, and that's one of the many things I constantly have to do. And again, I speak about my Twitter a lot because that's where a lot of my work goes into when I talk about this is debunking, 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 and making sure people get the right information and get a better idea as to what the science really says. So speaking of your Twitter, um, I saw you tweeted earlier today, you know, addressing the new CDC guidelines about masking, like outdoors mm -hmm. and everything. So, I mean, that kind of pertains to our question about, you know, what precautions should we be taking? What are your thoughts on, you know, I saw you mention that people should have a mask handy, even if they don't wear it after full vaccination. Is that correct? I think so. And I know this is, it's a controversial statement, but I'll say right now that uh, once again, so I made a, a flow diagram basically showing like if you are vaccinated versus if you're not vaccinated. Um, but the idea behind it really is like, um, and I stress, stress the point here is that like we should still take precautions and it's all based on how you evaluate risk at a situation. Um, CDC put out this really cool little infographic to show uh, what's a risky situation, what you should do when you're vaccinated versus unvaccinated. It's also about like, not just risk to yourself, but risk to others. Uh, so if you are, if you are vaccinated, so just to get everything clear out, you're less likely to transmit the virus. Um, and it's safe for you to be indoors with other folks who are vaccinated. Um, and, are, you know, you guys can interact. It's not a big deal, probably for like a small congregate setting, right? So like 10, maybe 10 people or so. Uh, and if you're outside, it's fine too. Like if you want to exercise, if you want to take a jog outside, it's fine to be unmasked. Uh, chance, again, we've shown, uh, we've gathered data from many places all over uh, to show that uh, chances of transmission outdoors is very minimal. And this is us also better understanding how the virus moves across air too. Um, so that's one of the many things uh, I can, outdoor eating is fine especially now that it's getting warmer this is a perfect time as well um also outdoor so also like for certain outdoor activities i say you know if you're just like out and about with a small small group of people it's fine like it's not a big deal um however if you happen to be let's say suddenly you're going to a concert 
You go to a concert and there's hundreds of people around, uh, hundreds of people around, and it's very hard for you to really socially distance and um, and you don't know the vaccination status of everyone in there. Put on a mask um, because at that point the risk goes up, right? You have to think about the fact it's a it's a gauge, and so um, that flow diagram again. I, I stressed that in my tweet that. Uh, it's all about how you proceed. Uh, like it's for you to decide based on the external environment or what makes sense. Um, indoor is still a risky thing because we find that a lot of transmission happens indoors. Um, so uh, if you are not vaccinated, uh, I can't think of a situation anywhere where you should not be wearing a mask going indoors. Um, the only time that I could think of where you would wear uh, not wear a mask is maybe if you're exercising outdoors um or if you know you happen to be walking around or whatever but you should still probably mask especially if you're if you're not vaccinated that's just kind of my opinion um or you should be trying to get vaccinated in general so but this is just one of those things that like again it's not necessarily about you as a risk risk to you but it's also risk to others as well so if you do become uh, infectious uh with um covid if you're walking around and you're not vaccinated and you're just spreading, <laughs> you're just in your spreading, um, you, there is a chance that you could actually infect someone. Uh, the chances are low, but the chances are still there. So again, you have to think about it from all those perspectives. I, I was curious though, do you think that like with this whole idea of, you know, fully vaccinated people not wearing masks all the time, do you think some people might see them and think, oh, it's okay, they're not wearing a mask, even if they don't know whether they're fully vaccinated, and just assume, you know, is it going to perpetuate this idea of people deciding to let up and be, you know, not as strict about it, right? Yeah, and I think this is kind of the double-edged sword with this, and this is kind of why I said the policy is not perfect, um, especially with, like, aspects of that. I think one of the many things we wanted to address, really, when we were talking about loosening the mask restrictions is... One of the many issues that anti-vaxxers or vaccine hesitant folks raised was the fact that uh, they felt like there was no end to a cycle. There was no end to this. There was just nothing that they can do. So why bother? Right. And so part of this is just letting letting the public know. And at this point, most people should be aware regarding what's going on with COVID and the vaccine for the most part. Um, and so for us, it's like making sure we communicate the fact to folks the fact that, you know, Vaccinating, if you get vaccinated, your chance, you know, you have a lot more opportunities to do a lot of these act social activities that we weren't able to do for almost a year. Um, it's kind of like leading by example. Um, there's chances you are going to always, there's always going to be a chance you're going to have those individuals who will take advantage of it and they'll say, like, well, you know, whatever, those people aren't masked. I'm not going to. Um, but I mean, that under that underscores a much more serious issue in the fact that they are willing, they are under, they are trying to avoid getting vaccinated, which is a whole different set of issues right there. So, but for us, we're trying to address the folks who are feeling the stress and the long malaise, I guess, of like having to be in quarantine for a whole year of having to do that. So, okay, very good. Um, so we're going to take a quick break here. It's been about an hour and a half that we've been chatting with Dr. Nero here. I did see a couple questions from Valzers and Calesta. We will address those when we come back. So we didn't forget you. Don't worry. Um, but I want to, again, emphasize for anyone out there listening, don't hesitate to join the discussion, share your experiences. If you think of a question out of what we're talking about, of the topic at hand or anything like that, please ask. You know, we're, we're reading chat and we definitely want people to, um, you know, ask things and learn with us today. So, but yeah, let's take a quick five-ish minute break. You know, if you take longer than five minutes, it's not a problem. So do what you need to do. Um, and that goes for all of you in chat listening as well. Thank you for joining us today. It's not over. We still have some nope. more questions. We got lots to talk about, but we are going to take a quick break so we can all stretch. Sound good? See you all in a few minutes.
Oh, okay. I was muted. All right, we're back. <laughs> I was just like, okay. <laughs> All righty, folks. We are continuing the discussion. So for anybody joining in the middle of this, I'm going to have Dr. Nero briefly, quickly introduce himself, where we can find him on socials, things like that, just as a general reminder, just so everybody's not lost on what's going on right now. So... Sure, yeah. Uh, I'm Nero Fourier. Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter and Twitch on the same handle, as you guys can see in this lovely little layout that uh, Snow made. <laughs> uh, but I, I am the Global Health Advisor over at the U.S. State Department. I work specifically in infectious diseases um, for humanitarian crisis settings. Um, COVID has been the forefront of what, all the work that I've been doing. Um, kind of a little bit of briefly a bit about myself. I used to do a lot of work in HIV AIDS, um, Ebola, uh, tuberculosis and malaria and other um, uh, infectious diseases. Um, also deal with some of the like uh, rare tropical diseases as well. Um, so I have had many years working in all these crazy, crazy environments. Um, but right now, as of late, it's just been me focusing primarily on scientific communication of our uh, scientific health communication of COVID. Um, so I've been graciously invited by Snow to come over here and answer a lot of like questions that the community has uh, to kind of disentangle some of the misinformation and disinformation that's been going around and to really kind of help people address more better, uh, not more better, that's it, redundant, uh, address better like how to deal with a lot of these COVID related items. So that's it for me. Well, the honor is ours, honestly. Thank you for taking time to speak with us today. Sure. Um, so we did have a couple questions right before the break that I wanted to make sure we didn't skip. Um, from Vowsers. Vowsers asked, um, is there a possibility of the virus mutating enough um, in a short space of time to make the use of these vaccines that we currently have out uh, null and void? or ineffective it would take so just to kind of and i did i did about this earlier today too so for mutations and everything like that uh one of the many things that um we benefited from but unfortunately this has somewhat circumvented with like the mutation aspects of uh this virus is that we um really need to reduce transmission because if we reduce transmission we're less likely to um, introduce like replication uh, errors in replication and mutations as a result of it. Uh, that being said, after all this time, uh, there has only been two or three mutations that really have uh, been of concern. What's what's actually filtering into a lot of the stuff that we talk about with variants. Um, we. I think it's going to take a lot more for us to really see mutations that would actually null and void um, vaccines. I can tell you that right now. The you know, especially when you look at the structure of the spike protein. So when you look at the coronavirus, it's it's like you know, let's just a circle. It's got all these little spikes that are around it, and those those spike proteins are very convoluted shapes. So. Uh, and what happens is that when we introduce mutations to it, it creates a different configuration in that shape of the spike protein. So it could have an indentation one in here. It might have a protruding spike right there. It might, it, it might change different conformations of that spike protein. Um, and certain, certain key mutations as a result of it could result in certain things such as more transmissibility or higher transmissibility or virulence. Like, so it would cause you to get more sick uh, and all sorts of stuff. Um, that being said, uh, even after all this time, we've only cer seen certain mutations that has resulted in something that would make us be concerned. So it usually actually kind of bodes well. And you'll hear this many times in the genetic uh, genetic community is like a, of this uh, convergence factor is that eventually there's a comes to a point where the virus can't really do too much after a certain point in terms of mutation wise. Um, and that it's this is pretty much it that's all we're going to see in terms of like really bad mutations um but this is a theory um so the chances so i will tell you right now the chances are very low of it actually nullifying um uh, avoiding our vaccines effort right now uh, we have engineered these vaccines to be very effective in terms of addressing all the different aspects of the spike protein um that being said, we are actually are still doing research and we're still making updates to the vaccine just in case something happens. Um, and it's one of the many cool things about the mRNA vaccines, which is what Pfizer and Moderna are, is that it takes very 
it, it's very quick for us to just simply tweak the formula for us to address certain mutations. If something does happen where, let's say, a new variant comes out with a mutation that we've never seen before that suddenly makes it 100 times more infective, uh, infectious, then we would be able to address that aspect as well. But nothing ever evades immune systems 100%. Our immune system is actually pretty complicated and very, uh, you know, it, it, it has like a, a good capacity to really deal with like a lot of these things that like these viruses throw at us. Um, so especially once we get a vaccine that once you get vaccinated, uh, your immune cell, your immune system, so like T cells, B cells and all those other things that which I can go into like maybe some other time um, have do a remarkable job of adapting and being able to figure out what the next steps to do to ensure that you're protected. So Speaking of mutations, um, I think it's the E four eighty four K or right. I, that's the one I read about. That's just rampant right now, especially in Japan. And people have said that that's the mutation that is bypassing the current vaccines. Is that true? Uh, so the E four, it's not the E four A four K mutation is actually the more transmissible one. So it, uh, it's just a lot more. It's just has like so. Imagine that that spike protein on that virus. Uh, suddenly it mutated and now it went from a little fish hook to a giant anchor. <laughs> Let's think of it that way. So it's more likely to quickly attach to, your, as someone mentioned, the ACE2 cells or anything like that. It's more likely to attach to human cells and tighter. Um, so you're more likely to become transmissible as a result of it. Um, there is other mutations such as the B1351 variant and all those other ones uh, that, um, and I can't remember the mutation on top of my head, L five four two R, I can't remember um, exactly because there's so many of them <laughs> um, that increases like the chances of it evading uh, the immune response, but it's not a hundred percent. There's like there's still buffer room for when we vaccinate someone and their protection. Um, so it's only like a little bit, but and you'll hear a lot of sensational news articles be like, oh no, this variant just came out and uh, it could evade the immune system. And I'm like. To an extent, but it that doesn't mean it's it it doesn't mean that your immune system is completely useless. It actually means right. that your immune system is less likely to uh, not catch certain like certain what cells as, or viruses that to come through, but it's still going to capture most of it. So you're less likely to become like intensely sick. You're not going to die from like you know a viral explosion explosion in your system. So okay. Thanks for clarifying, because I, I remember reading something about the, the E484K, which I know it's primarily in Japan, but apparently it's also here in the U.S. in some states. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's important to clarify, right, whether or not that's some, that's true. And, and I think that's, you know, fear mongering, as you said before. Mm hmm. Yep. Um, we have another question here be right before the break from Calesta um, asking... Is there going to be some sort of research and support networks set up for long haulers? Uh, there's such a wide variety of symptoms and surviving COVID isn't always thriving in some cases. I assume long haulers are people who survive COVID. Is that correct? So long haulers can be anyone, right? It could be anyone who have had mild to no symptoms, or it could be someone who had severe symptoms um, who got COVID and then recovered. Um, we have seen folks who have recovered that have had uh, you know, severe symptoms, like such as uh, neurological issues. Uh, we've seen issues in the like uh, low intestinal issues. We've seen, um, you know, inflammation and rash that continue to persist and like all these and malaise and it, it goes all over the place. We still don't have a full understanding. The running hypothesis that we have right now is that um, even after your infection, that there's like a reservoir or like remnants of like this virus just still keeping hold in certain areas and just continuously inflaming that response over and over and over again. Um, but what's cool is the fact that we've seen promising evidence that the fact that getting the vaccine actually reduces those viral reservoir um, and people have conditions have improved. That being said, that study is still ongoing. We still need to look into it. Um, and I agree full heartedly that we still need to maintain support groups and things like that to ensure that we are addressing long haulers. I will say right now that we don't have something like biggest substantial creative for it. Uh, we have some hotlines and we have some like some like that, but from a national response perspective, we haven't really done much because we've been so focused on vaccinations and recovery efforts. So um, 
And I have seen the COVID long haulers as well, but I, I'm thinking much more of a federal uh, perspective as well. So we need to be and part of the bills that we have seen in terms of like um, funding wise, there are there are some funding sources that are going into it, um, but we need to be much more uh, bigger picture of this aspect of it as well. Um, so uh, yes, there is a thing. There are folks that are doing this work. Is it? as grandiose and big as I wanted to be, probably not. Um, there's not many folks that are reporting on it, um, but we. I think uh, one of the many things I tell for long haulers too is to share their stories. And uh, you know, if there are studies that are out there, feel free to volunteer. There are a lot of studies that are happening out there that are looking at long haulers, um, but yeah. I think that's good information because I think for a lot of people, especially when they've had COVID, they may not know what's available for them as resources because a, a lot of people have mentioned you know people they know or people themselves in our community have mentioned mm -hmm. that these that they know people or they themselves are still suffering some of these side effects long term right after mm -hmm. they fully recovered and and it's just been i think it's it's for a lot i mean i didn't even know that there's been research going on and it makes sense there should be because we're still learning mm -hmm. about covid right and yeah. this is something we need to look at way beyond yeah. now yeah. Also, I just realized too. I'm the real. I want to make sure I correct myself. See, I make mistakes too. The E4A 4K is the one that's responsible for the immune evasion. Uh, I'm thinking another another one as well. So, just to correct myself from an earlier statement, that is the one that's been shown to uh, evade the long immune system response as well. But um, but not 100 sure percent. Right. Not 100 percent correct. Okay. Just want to clarify because I don't, I don't want people to be like panicking about this mutation, right? No, and uh, I, I think one of the many things I tell people, so remember that, well, not remember, sorry, most people don't know. When we first started talking about vaccines in the United States and the development of it, we were we were aiming for 60 to 70% effect, efficacy. Um, so, but we got vaccines that are above that, right? Like we sh we've seen vaccines that are like highly effective um, and also reduce transmissibility and all sort other of stuff. Um, and we've seen that in this new technology, mRNA technology has actually been a huge improvement in terms of like actually uh, being very smart and adapting to uh, a lot of the challenges of kind of like the variants and all sort of stuff aspect. We're always constant. I can tell you right now, from the perspective of people I know in Pfizer and Moderna, we are constantly monitoring variants every day. If something comes up, if we're surveillance, that's why we're, it's important that we do genomic surveillance, right? Because we're checking to see, is there something, a mutation that's happening that we should be aware of? Um, especially for India with the explosion of their cases, uh, we need to be checking every day as much as we can to see if there is a mutation that arises out of there that might happen. You'll see a lot of news articles talk about the double mutant or the triple mutant, which in my head is a stupid title because it doesn't make any sense. Um, <laughs> but like, we need to be better understanding to say like, oh, well, how does this affect people in a population perspective? Does it, uh, how does it affect people, um, you know, from disease perspective? Does it make it worse? Does it make it less? Is it less? Is it the same? And there's a lot that goes into it, which we just say, we can't just look at a mutation and be like, that mutation looks uh, sus, sus. We got to do something about it. We <laughs> yeah. have to actually like see <laughs> real life data as a result of it. Um, and I can tell those people like that's, when you see all those articles that's sensational and everything like that, just be cautious about it. Okay, that's good to know. Calesta was asking where to sign up for those long hauler studies, if you have any information on that. Um, I don't have any on top of my head right now, but let me do some research and I'm happy to post them in Snow's Discord. Uh, so um, let me put that as a follow up for Perfect. folks. But yeah, I mean, I didn't know that those were happening, but I think it makes sense. I think it's especially uh, at least we've been in my community, been hearing stories about how people, either people they know or people themselves have, you know, had COVID, they've recovered, but they're still suffering these these side effects. And, you know, they may they may re they may not think there's any support or resources for them to figure out what's going on. You know, if there's anything detrimental coming from all of this. Right. Yeah. And, you know, for people who have access to a healthcare project, like healthcare provider, and I say people who do, because I want to be conscientious of folks who don't have that readily available. 
Um, if you do have access to it, really reach out to them. Uh, they will be the first ones to tell you, here's some of the resources, and this might be a, a trial that or a study that you could be involved in. Um, I think the many thing is, is that like, if you are suffering from long-term effects, uh, which, you know, we call post-acute sequelae syndrome <laughs> condition, uh, we're not don't do it alone. Like, don't be quiet about it. Be very vocal. Be, you know, be on the lookout for studies and stuff like that uh, and figure out where you can really um, contribute to it. Because the thing is, is that until we have, until we get more people involved in these studies and data, we're just going to be in the blind regarding these effects of it. Okay. Very good information. But yeah, we'll, we'll update all of you um, later on that if you're interested. Yep. Um, our next question here is from me. Is there any issue to getting a different brand of vaccine during your second dose compared to the first dose? For example, you get Pfizer on your first dose and Moderna on your second. So there's not enough evidence supporting mixing of doses right now. So, and it's even less evidence regarding mixture. Uh, there are some studies, I won't say that there aren't happening. Uh, I know the EU has been doing stuff regarding mixing the mRNA with the adenovirus vector vaccine. So Pfizer with AstraZeneca. Uh, there's just not enough evidence supporting efficacy for uh, mixing and matching of it. Um, so I will tell you right now from a uh, practicing perspective, no, I would not recommend mixing it. Uh, focus really on keeping it within the same brand. Um, there's just not enough data to show what might happen if you were to mix it. And, um, you know, I think you just shouldn't take that risk. Yeah, I think the the reason I brought that up is because um, and there was a news article probably last week where a man accidentally got the wrong second dose, yeah. and I don't know if there's any effects after that. I haven't checked to see if there was any follow up, but um, I think the article mentioned that there shouldn't be any issues. But I wanted to know if you had any idea, you know, and what your thoughts were on that. There shouldn't be, especially if it's like an mRNA to mRNA, um, so Pfizer Moderna, but like. Uh, I think the more concerning factor for me is like if we were to mix like a mRNA with some other technology and that's where I draw the line really because I, I just don't know what might happen. Um, I really don't know. And from mRNA, mRNA, I'm, I'm assuming probably nothing big or deal happens, but it's more of, again, we would need to, hopefully that person is probably being monitored and we're taking uh, sam you know blood samples and things like that and making sure that we're tracking uh, if they're producing, uh, you know, neutralizing antibodies, are they, how's their T cells and blah, 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 and really monitoring it. But I just, um, like I said, I won't tell anyone in this chat what I don't know. And I don't know that would happen, okay. but I think it's best to just stick with the same brand. Okay. Very good. Um, so that moves to our next question, which I think you've actually kind of covered, but, um, sure. you know, anything else you need to add? There are several mutations now of COVID-19. Uh, I don't know how many. You, I don't know if you have a number or anything, but should we be concerned about the current vaccines being able to cover those new mutations? Absolutely. We our current our current vaccines are actually still effective against the mutations. We have seen data coming out of South Africa. We have seen data coming out uh, parts of Brazil and also within the United States where B117 is the most rampant uh, variant of uh, concern. Um, I think we are still showing that it is still very highly effic efficacious in terms of a lot of these environments. Um, and that being said, though, we are still creating uh, a lot. I can tell you right now from someone I know who works directly in Pfizer, they're still working. They're still working on making sure that uh, to develop and to have something ready in case of some variant some from the current variants that are going around to say, OK, well, if something does happen, like if the South Africa variant suddenly becomes something happens and it becomes much more mutatious or something and whatever it might happen, then we are able to address that. So, but that's like the whole di discussion with booster, which I know we have something down the line regarding that, but the bottom line is, is that the vaccines are still effective in face of all of these variants. They are still, they still have shown great results. Um, and we've seen multiple studies done on multiple large scale populations, at risk populations, HIV positive, negative populations, every single one that we can think of. And with pregnant women as well, right now, um, we have seen, um, and they have just been phenomenal results that have shown that not only does it reduce severe disease and reduce death 
severely, but it's the fact that we have seen that it reduces transmission. So you're not transmitting to your loved ones. So. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask how, I guess, how do they determine when a mutation, a new mutation pops up? Is it just the spike protein makeup? It's like, how does that get detected when somebody's tested, for example, that might have a new variant that's not recognized? Like so how, that's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, when we, earlier January last year, we actually received the original sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-CoV-2. Um, is what we call, uh, we'll call it the OG virus. Okay. But the OG virus, we know the exact sequence. So any sort of like, uh, changes to the sequence of the virus's DNA, we'll, we basically can have a good, we usually for us, we can find out if it results in certain, uh, certain mutations or things like that, that would occur. Now for us to actually think of something where it's like, oh, this might result in something that's bad. We have to see it in practice, right? Like we, so we don't exactly know. Um, if a mutation is, a, is something of concern until we start seeing it in play in the environment. There's just no way for us to predict that. We have some inkling, but we don't. So seeing certain mutations, and it's this is why I say it's important for us to continuously genomic surveillance. Uh, we're constantly taking people who are uh, infected with COVID and taking samples and saying, okay, what are they infected with? What's the difference in their, their sequence versus the OG virus? And we can determine whether certain mutations are much more predominant in a population and we can see like what's the mortality rate and we can determine whether if it's a mutation of concern okay so Wake has a question uh who found the original sequence and how did they find it it was actually the chinese uh the original wuhan lab over there and it was in this individual and i can't and i don't remember the exact story so I will just say what I know is that I think they, when they first sequenced it, they released it out, I think in Medar XR RIV or is it GitHub? Somewhat, they basically released the whole sequence to the rest of the world and based it. And uh, it was like January 10th or something like that. And the world pretty much just grabbed it and was just like, okay, folks, let's get busy. Um, and we just started working on it. But it was, it was a, it was a Chinese scientist that found it and distributed it to the rest of the world. Okay. We do have a question here from Sarah um, asking, is there anything we need to do before getting vaccinated or after getting vaccinated? Um, before you get vaccinated, um, no, because there's not many, like, I mean, unless if like, if you have like a really, if you, like, I guess it's just more of like for folks who are immunocompromised or like have diseases or they're, they're um, have caused them to become immunodeficient or anything like that. There's not really anything I could think of that would uh, be something you should bring up. I mean, they, they like, here's the thing is that when you go in, uh, they will ask you questions about all this other stuff. Um, I think also know, know the status of like, whether you have uh, been exposed to COVID or not, or if you have a good inkling of it, because um, that's something they'll ask you, but they're not going to test you on the spot. They don't do that. Um, and also just making sure that, um, you know, when you do get the vaccine that you take a day or two off, if you can, um, especially, you know, take into account side effects about it. We want, I always want to make sure to tell people that uh, when you do have that, you, you're you much more conscientious of the fact that you're not just simply running in blind uh, for that reason. Um, but that's really, I mean, there's not really, I, I could tell you right now, there's not really a lot that you need to, it, depends, it also depends on the site as well. Like some sites have required you to bring lots of documents, read up on that, make sure that you have all those documents ready. So when you go there, that you're prepared to go. Um, and um, that's about it really. Uh, and then also like, if you have concerns or questions regarding your, vac your vaccine, have them ready. And the people there can usually ask those questions as well. So. We have we have a really, really good question here, actually, from Twining um, asking, okay. uh, is there any risk of blood clots within with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines? Uh, Twining has seen a lot of misinformation floating around that's making them nervous about getting the second Pfizer dose tomorrow. No. So right now we actually did evaluate some of the uh, we did actually. So, so let me take a step back. So when, during our investigation of the J&J &J vaccine, we did investigate the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine as well. Uh, there was about a single digit number, I can't remember on top of my head, of specific blood clots. And we did we realized at the end that they weren't linked. We looked at it and 
didn't feel like there was an actual causal link from there because there were, you know, we checked their platelet factors and all sort of stuff. And it was not like an abnormal type of like blood clots that we saw in the J&J. Um, and they, and I think we just ended up saying, we, when we looked at the data, we were like, this doesn't result in anything. Um, it wasn't as a result of it. It was like something so insignificantly small that we we're like, we don't think it's actually a risk factor for it. So no, you won't be um, at risk for that, what we call the TTS, that type of like clot. You're not going to be at risk for that. Um, there might be a chance you might get that specific type of blood clot that you're talking about, but I haven't, I don't think based on the data from what I've seen that you will, something you should worry about. I'm being, it's just that insignificant. So. Um, we also have a follow-up question about what to do before and after getting vaccinated from batch asking, uh, I've heard no Motrin or Tylenol before and no drinking, assuming alcohol for three days after. Is that correct? Uh, you could drink. <laughs> you could drink. I, I think it's just more of like probably shouldn't mix your alcohol and your your drugs. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, in terms of like the ibuprofen or Motrin and things like that, um, this is kind of like another hot topic amongst the uh, academic sciences and everything like that. I will tell you right now from personally, like my husband and I, we we took Tylenol after we got our vaccine, and we just stuck with that. Um, especially since you know we from a immune response perspective, we don't want to uh, reduce some of the, uh, you know, kind of, a, it kind of, we don't want it to dampen the responses of it. So from a prince, from a theory perspective, we don't want it to do that. So we, by practice as well, but we, so we usually say, you know, to take Tylenol, um, but don't feel like it's the end of the world if that is the only option you have in your house. Uh, so I, so I just want people to know that. Um, in terms of like the alcohol, I mean, like if you have no symptoms, I mean, I'm not, go go crazy. Just don't go blackout drunk. <laughs> so. so like we don't have to be concerned about any of that reducing the efficiency of the vaccine or anything like that, right? right? No, no, I don't think okay. so. Good stuff. Um, moving on to the next question here from Vinius. Vinius says that they got the Johnson vaccine. How long can <laughs> I expect the vaccine to last? Will I need to get another vaccine in the future? It's a great question. Uh, it's actually been a contentious button on a lot of uh, folks. We don't know yet when you might need a follow-up shot. I will tell that to everyone right now. Uh, no one can say that. Uh, none of the science has any sort of data regarding it because we are not even a year into our distribution of it. We just opened up recently for everyone, eligibility-wise, for 16 and up for a lot of these vaccines. So... Um, you'll hear a lot of terms called immunogenicity, so like how the strength of your immune response and all this sort of stuff. We we just don't know yet, um, and we need to collect more data. However, evidence currently suggests the fact that you know we will be offered robust protection for a considerable amount of time. So keep in mind that you won't. We won't know yet. Uh, we will follow up with guidance once, like probably, I think a year. Once a year passes, we'll probably have a really good idea. But remember, not everyone received their doses in equal times. Uh, not everyone might have gotten it, and we don't know if there's another mutation that might might occur that might require us to get booster shots. It's just so uncertain right now. So I just can't. No one should be able to tell you. Oh, you might need it in a year. We don't know that yet. No one knows that yet. Like if anyone tells you that, they're full of crap. <laughs> so. So basically um, just stay vigilant, you know, stay informed, right? Yep. So That's it. Okay. Uh, our next question here is from multiple people. Vinius, Twining, mm -hmm. Fish, and Rastra all asked, will COVID-19 get to the level where humans understand it enough to where it's compared to the level of, for example, having the flu? Is there a chance that COVID vaccines will become a yearly thing like a flu shot? which I guess goes into booster shots, things like that. So I think we have a pretty decent understanding of COVID. Um, it's just the knowledge always changes because we, the virus is going to change. So like that's the nature of viruses, they mutate. Um, the COVID, I will say right now for the SARS-CoV-2, um, it has the benefit of being a slow mutator. It's a very slow. Uh, mutate, mutating um, aspect of it. But the only reason why it's we've seen a lot more is because it's had so many hosts to infect um, that we're seeing as a result of that. So that's one aspect of it. Um, 
will we ever get to the point where we understand it will be compared to having the flu? I don't know. I think maybe probably like when we might get to a point where I think, let me rephrase. I think we will, but I don't know when. Um, so in terms of like if of there being a vaccine for a yearly thing, once again, we don't know yet. Um, we, we have to see how the population looks in terms of response wise um, and really double check to make sure that uh, the response is still there and that we're protected over the long run. Um, so there's a lot of outside factors and inside factors that we still need to take a look at from a population perspective, individual perspective to really understand if we need to have a follow-up shot or not. Okay, very good. Uh, we have a quick question here in chat from Michigan's asking, uh, for someone like me who is immunocompromised, specifically diabetic, Will it be harder for someone like me to recover from the initial vaccine, like the first dose, I assume? Um, so we haven't, I mean, I don't know about what you mean by recover. Are you talking about side effects? Let me just make sure to clarify. Uh, are you discussing in terms of like uh, recover from the side effects of the initial vaccine? That's the way uh, I interpreted I, it. But Michigan's let us know in chat. Yeah, I don't want to miss, I don't want to misinterpret your question. Yeah. Um, but I think, um, well, I, there's been several side effect side effects to the vaccine, correct? Let's let's yeah. cover some of the basic side effects that we've heard or seen. Um, I mean, so what we've seen, like you know, is like fatigue, muscle muscle achiness, uh, low grade fever. Um, sometimes, like we've seen rash uh, as a result of it, um, and then like the more severe ones are like what we call the anaphylaxis, or like the really severe allergic reaction. But those are so very rare. But we still do expect people who do experience like certain aspects of it to report those immediately. Uh, but they're very rare. Um, happens like in like very like small percentage of the population. Uh, for a lot of immunocompromised people, to getting back to Michigan's question, so I see that they are talking about side effects. Um, we haven't seen, we, for a lot of the immunocompromised people, we've seen most folks don't typically see side effects just because the immune system is not uh, strong enough to really mount a kind of a robust, robust response when you do get the vaccine. Um, that being said, we're still investigating right now. There's actually a study that's being done by one of my colleagues uh, that she's looking at into long, uh, for people who are immunocompromised, uh, who do get the vaccine and then just kind of monitoring it. If you are interested, I can point you in her direction. Um, but there are studies being done because we still don't have a full understanding because once again, remember these vaccines are under emergency use authorization. So it didn't have a chance to really, uh, be in a clinical trial with people who were immunocompromised. So we're still kind of investigating that factor, but we haven't seen enough data to support the fact that not getting, like getting the vaccine will end up hurting you. So that's the reason why we say we should still get the vaccine. Um, whether if you mount an effective response is a different story, we can't tell you yet. Um, we, we have an inkling that it does mount some response, but probably not as strong as someone who's not immunocompromised. Okay, so the basic idea is that for anybody who is immunocompromised, but they're hesitant to get the vaccine because they've heard of side effects, they should still get it. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Yeah. The thing is, is that like it's uh, it has a higher I'm not going to lie and say that it doesn't have a high pro it has a high profile of side effects, but they literally go go come and go within 48 hours. They literally go come and go within 48 hours. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, our next question here is from Twining Vines. What would you tell people who are concerned about how quickly the vaccine was developed? It's a great question. So it's actually a common one I get. Uh, so I will tell you right now that uh, in terms of the development, it has several benefits from it. One, uh, it had absolutely a ridiculous Boku amount of money invested in it uh in, in a lot of these efforts so resources and a lot of regulatory hurdles and a lot of uh, concerns about a lot of things that most industries would be concerned about in terms it slows down during the process of the development were eliminated from there so we basically pumped every single everyone wrote a ridiculous amount of check to basically develop these uh so we eliminated a lot of risk factors for companies to do that second we have so many clinical trials as a result of it. Now, in the typical clinical trial, when we, let's say, let's talk about Ebola, for example. Uh, when we were developing a vaccine for Ebola, 
there is not many people who have Ebola, even though we talk about it as an infectious disease. There's actually like it's actually much smaller if you compare it to COVID, right? Like it may be a couple thousand people. And as a result of it, it makes it very difficult for us to really uh, run clinical trials with large sample sizes, really evaluate what the effectiveness of it is. And that's something that we did not have issue with with COVID. Like for COVID, when we were running the trials, it was so easy. We literally just closed our eyes, pointed a finger at part of a map, boom. We have 3,000 applicants to, I mean, that's something around there, but like we had so much like samples to essentially or uh, participants that were able to actually be part of these clinical trials. It was much easier for us to uh, essentially gather the data and really do analysis of it. And that's one of the many benefits from these clinical trials uh, from that perspective. Uh, Fourth is the fact that none of the none of the regulatory and none of the decision factors were rushed. Uh, in fact, we were criticized uh, by the world with the FDA and everyone when they were first deciding that we were taking too little time. We were taking too much time actually of deciding. And the, the reason why was because we were sitting there crunching numbers, looking at all the figures from clinical trials, all the things that we were doing, asking questions left and right, making sure that whatever, when it did get an emergency use authorization, that it was something that was shown to be for 99.999% safe across all the population um, and the risks were low. And I can tell you, and the thing is that guys, every single one of these meetings you can attend them. Like they're all available on YouTube and I, I usually post them on Twitter, uh, where the link you can go. You can listen and hear what they're discussing and what they're having dis uh, like debates on. Um, so it's it's very transparent. We're always talking about it. And um, so that's another factor of it as well. So you have basically like, and then also like for the last factor is the fact that everyone was working on this problem set. This is an example of a situation where like, if you had the whole scientific community collecting their data and doing research on it, chances are you're gonna get to a solution pretty quickly. And that's something we've never observed in any sort of disease research ever. Like imagine if we did this for cancer or something like that, I can guarantee you we'll might have something, but we never had anything where we had like the whole worldwide scientific community really invested in a problem set looking through a lot of this work right here and that's one of the many things i can tell you right now is uh one of the like i guess several factors that you shouldn't worry about the fact that it was developed quickly it wasn't um it was developed in a shorter amount of time but it wouldn't say that we skipped any steps or we uh decided to cut certain things down no we actually just had obscene amount of resources we had obscene amount of like uh you know resources, not even just from money, but from people and also from patients as well to really investigate the full gamut of this disease. Just to give a bit of context, because some people might not realize, um, on average, how long does it take to develop a vaccine for an infectious disease? And how long did the COVID vaccine take to be developed? So the most recent one, so, so the COVID was probably less than a year. Um, but like the MMR one was developed in five years. Uh, but keeping in mind that that when that technology was that technology back then, we were much slower back then. We didn't have the technology to really do it. And the fact is that the, the MRA technology, by the way, that fuels into Pfizer and Moderna, we've been looking at that for the past 10 years. It's not something new. Uh, so if anyone's going to tell you, well, this is experimental, and this is new. Bam, this has been something we've been looking at for a very long time. We basically took that technology, tweaked it based on the genomic sequencing of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and said, okay, fam, this is, this, is, this is about right. And we basically went to town on modifying and basically being able to uh, create the vaccines that we have today. Um, and yes, for batch, that is correct that we did. We were able to stagger a lot of steps as well because we didn't. Uh, that's the that's part of the factor of the fact that we had so many resources and we had so many people that we can actually be able to stagger a lot of these steps along the way and save a lot of time as a result of it. Um, so a lot of this was just very effective uh, research uh, management as far as that. I had no idea the mRNA technology was around for that long. You said a yeah. decade? It's been around for quite some time. Oh, um, wow. We just, never, I mean, the thing is, is that the Pfizer and Moderna are the very first vaccines that utilize that technology. Oh, okay. So, so what was that technology used for before vaccines then? 
it was very much experimental in terms of the fact that like we were still investigating it. Um, the woman who invested a uh, Kirka, I, I'm butchering her poor name and I apologize. Uh, she has been working on it for quite some time and <coughs> excuse me. And she has basically been using it for quite some time to kind of respond to it. The limitations at that point though, for the MRNA technology was the fact that uh, it, mRNA in general, like, is very unstable. Like, it's just, it once it gets into the system, it degrades really quickly. So they needed to find a way, a creative way to uh, encapsulate that mRNA and bring it into the system and then release it. And that's one of the, that's one of the really cool things about this vaccine is that we use this thing called a lipid nano tech, baby, a lipid nano particle to encapsulate this mRNA so that it stays stable bring it into the blood, bring it into your system, into the cell and releases. And then you get, and then it's able to do its job. And then once it's done, it degrades. It doesn't, it doesn't stick around in your system. Oh, so the, I guess the instability or unstableness of it is, be, is that why it needs to be refrigerated compared to like the Johnson and Johnson vaccine? Correct. Okay. Very cool. I'm learning some mm -hmm. stuff today. You are. Yeah. yeah. All right, our next question here comes from Batch. Uh, can you briefly explain how the mRNA vaccines work, which we've kind of been talking about, and how yeah. the attenuated virus vaccines work, which is, I assume, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, right? It's actually not. The Johnson oh. & Johnson is okay. an adenovirus vector vaccine. Um, attenuated is a different version. It's just a weakened version of the virus. Uh, but I'll go into the detail about what mRNA technology does. So in general, so mRNA is just basically a single strand sequence of a genetic code and everything. It's coded to code to create a specific protein. So when we created this technology, we wanted to, this a way for us to um, create a way so that our immune system can recognize uh, the protein, that spike protein that I said that comes from the coronavirus. And we want the immune system to recognize it so that once it like learns it, it can essentially mount an effective response and teach the rest of your immune system that said, hey, you see that guy over there that has that spike protein? Beat the snot out of him. That's essentially what we're doing here. And what we're seeing, what we, when we see the mRNA vaccine, so I kind of spoke about it briefly, it's encapsulated in a lipid nano, nanoparticle. It goes into your cell, it doesn't enter your nucleus, by the way, which is where your DNA is at. Uh, and what it does is that it releases and you have these little organelles called ribosome. And they come in and they're like, oh, okay, there's this mRNA here. I don't, whatever, I'm just gonna nom, nom, nom. It noms it and creates this spike protein. And that spike protein basically surfaces on the surface of that cell. And what your immune system realizes, and then what it does is that it presents it to the immune system and your immune system takes it and basically it adds it to a compendium. It says, okay, cool. This spike protein, next time I see it, I know I know when to beat that guy up. That's why your first dose, you typically don't see it because it's kind of like you're you just given the, you know, In, like coronavirus 101. Right. What's up? Like, you're, like your body's just given the information on what to look for, right? Yeah, it's like you're given a crash course for them. Then the second time when you get their second dose, so this I know this is a question later down the line, when you get the second dose and everything like that, your body really knows at that point um at that at that juncture it's like yo this guy right there i know i've seen him before we gotta take him out <laughs> um and the thing is, is that when we create um these when we when the cell gets those spike proteins the immune system gets it it creates these things called antibodies and what those antibodies really do um and this is my colloquial way of saying it it cock blocks the sars cov2 <laughs> mm -hmm. It, prevent, it prevents it from attaching to a cell. It prevents it from uh, essentially infecting cells. And as a result, you're not going to get a infectious, you're not going to see an explosion replication of that. So that's what essentially that, you know, those antibodies do um, to essentially block that virus, especially. So what about attenuated virus vaccines? Is this kind of like the flu shot? Maybe. Yeah, so attenuated virus is just a weakened version of the virus. It's another way. It's actually one of the oldest ways that we've done before, right? That we basically take uh, a very weakened version of this virus. Let's just let's just say we created this neurovirus. 
and this, it's I circulating and it's there. infecting everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's infecting everyone. And so for us, that's like actually one of the first steps we take a look at too. It's like, okay, well, can we inject people with a weakened version of the virus so that, and when we say weakened, it's like, it doesn't really uh, replicate like crazy. It's just very, it's very like, you know, it's very just like, it's like a slow poke version of it, very slow poke version of it. And so it gets in your system and then your immune system grabs it, eats it, does its thing and learns, learns it. It's also a way for it to learn like, oh, well, okay, if this virus comes into the system again, I'm going to beat the snot out of it. Um, so again, these, vi these vaccines are really there to make sure that it trains your immune system to uh, protect yourself against further infections from future cases right there. Um, but sometimes the, there's also risk that runs into it because there's also chances that you get the weakened version. You might get the weakened version of the disease itself, which is very rare, very rare but it does happen. Um, and sometimes it's not as effective. Um, and what we've seen now with uh, actually two Chinese viruses, that, uh, excuse me, two Chinese vaccines that are being produced that use attenuated versions. I think one in India as well. They use attenuated versions of the SARS-CoV-2. And again, there's challenges with those because especially if you use, let's say if I create an attenuated version of the OG SARS-CoV-2 virus, what happens when it gets exposed to a, 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 a variant? probably doesn't mount an effective response as well, um, which is why it's actually really smart for the scientists to essentially target the spike protein because uh, we realize that, hey, this virus can't do dilly squat if it can't attach itself to a cell. It's literally just sitting there just going like, okay, cool. I guess I'll just go away yeah. <laughs> after I've <I'm> done. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, I mean, and that's it's essentially what we're looking at here. So just to clarify, then the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and the, I guess, AstraZeneca vaccine, they are not attenuated virus vaccines, correct? correct. Uh, so what, what exactly is the technology called... there then? Uh, so they use a technology called adenovirus vector vaccine. And so what I call it, what I consider that is like, it's like a Trojan horse vaccine. And I say Trojan horse is because it uses a virus to enter, to essentially enter in and do the work. And so um, when we call adeno vector virus, or so there, there are very specific types of um, viruses. And so what we do is like basically snip their reproductive gene and say, and it's and basically just make sure that it's just holding the actual DNA of the whatever like vaccine that we're bringing in. And so it's just a delivery mechanism. It has nothing to do with anything else. So once it gets into your bloodstream, uh, it degrades. And once it enters the cell and it goes away. So now the difference between the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca is that AstraZeneca uses a chimp uh, adenovirus and the J&J &J uses a human adenovirus. Uh, we don't know whether if that might make a difference in terms of responses, but that's just letting people know. I'm just letting people know that that's what it is. So once that adenovirus enters in, when you inject someone with a vaccine uh, and it inserts the, inserts the genetic components of the vaccine into a cell, it goes away. It does not stick around. It's literally just, it has nothing to do. It's just, it has no, it can't reproduce. It's just sitting there. It's just a shell. So. Okay. That's good clarification in case anybody was hesitant to get the vaccines because they don't want stuff to stay in their body. So all the vaccines... Mm -hmm they get out of your system after injection eventually. Absolutely, yeah. There's It's several hours, but they don't stick around in your system at all. Like, if, if they don't. And, like, a lot of people who complain, oh, well, I don't want someone creating massive amounts of spike proteins. And I'm like, well, one, the spike proteins themselves don't do anything. They need, It doesn't do anything. And then the second, the fact that um, – only encodes for a certain amount of time and then it stops it does there's, no, there's nothing sitting there there's no like it's not like you're perf being injected constantly with mrna like i suppose if you were to constantly if every day you were being injected with mrna you should be concerned but that's not what's happening here so okay very good clarification mm -hmm. um so we have another question here from batch uh, do you have any hypotheses about what would be causing the unique clotting issue with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and why they seem to disproportionately impact women? We did we talk don't. about this earlier, but basically why this is happening. 
And correction to that one is actually it's a it's an adenovirus vector vaccine, not the attenuated. Uh, we don't have any. We we have a somewhat of a hypothesis. We're assuming that there's a specific. Uh, what we call heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Um, you can guys can take a look at that. It's a very specific immune response where it has mimicked the same mechanism, um, but we don't have a actual like in-depth mic like mic like you know biochem response just to like what might be resulting in that um, those specific blood clots, uh, even more so with women. Uh, there's some running theories about certain types of MI MAIT cells, uh, mate cells that typically are exhibited higher in females that might have resulted in certain like uh, responses, but we don't, like I said, it's one of those things that we are still taking a um, additional dis details and studies for it. So I won't quote on it's like what might be the possible mechanism because we just simply don't know. So how, how would we know more? I mean, it, it's one of those like, in order for us to know more, more people would have to get it, the blood clot, right? So it's not really ideal <laughs> to in the name of research, right? So... I mean, we'll probably do some more just follow up with women who might have. And we, I mean, this, it's possible men can have it too. I don't want to say that men might not ever get it. So for guys in chat who are like, oh, I'm impervious, I'm like, we don't know yet. So, um, but yeah, we're, it, we're, it's just, we just don't know. Like, it's just, it's very complicated when you start looking at it because it's already happened. Um, and for us to like, it's like kind of, it's like you kind of have to like, really catch certain people at the right time to really kind of figure it out. It's, it's very hard situation, like problem set to solve when you look at immune responses. Okay. Very, very good. Um, so our next question here is, is from batch. Uh, we're going through all the batches <laughs> questions. Uh, so batch says, sorry to jam a little of my opinion in here, but I feel like we've been horribly failed by the public health messaging during this pandemic. What would you have done differently? We, I wouldn't say that we failed. And let me explain this really quickly too. Um, we were failed by the, we were failed by a lot of administrator priorities. Uh, we had several very powerful leaders in the world that were very, didn't take it seriously and basically gagged a lot of public health agencies and a lot of health agencies worldwide. Uh, we stifled a lot of resources and we also did a lot of detrimental damage to the trust and foundation of places like the CDC, for example. Uh, it, we're still recovering. Um, when Biden was elected as president, um, the first thing we did was basically having to recover everything and basically building that trust up from the beginning uh, once again. I would say we didn't fumble our initial ways of communicating a lot of this. Um, but this is the keep in mind too for everyone is that this is the first global pandemic we've ever been involved with. There is, I don't think anyone any there's any way that we can actually predict or actually put in systems that will predict everything that was going to happen. Uh, can we do better? Absolutely. We do. And the thing is, is that like we've been striving very hard within this administration, um, especially with Dr. Walensky running for CDC, who's a rock star in my world. Uh, you know. And a lot of the different folks who I work with on a daily basis, we are we are basically learning every day about what's what's a good way to communicate and what's a not. The, the thing about public health messaging, guys, and I want to stress this to everyone: sometimes the message might not get 100 percent of the way through for everyone. That's just uh, we've pol highly politicized. The last administration successfully politicized this virus. It highly politicized our intervention efforts, and it, and it politicized a lot of the work we were doing. And as a result, uh, for us to do public health messaging, we have to get past the politics as well, which is very difficult. I tell people, if it, the biggest example is masking, for example. Masking was such a hard ordeal to get across for people at the beginning, even when Biden was president. And a lot of times, and this is another problem too, is that we had a lot of bad scientists and a lot of bad doctors out there uh, basically promoting very bad messages uh, under the guise of reputable institutions. Um, I will say, and I say people to be cautious, Google the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, they are a bunch of scientists and doctors that basically are anti-vaxxers, anti-mask, and basically all about herd immunity. Basically saying that, well, people should just, we should just infect as many people as possible and watch them die and see, and maybe we'll basically get to the point where we have herd immunity. 
that's not the way we want to go. Like even 1% of the global population, it's very, 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 very difficult. Can you repeat that name? Yeah. Uh, oh, there you go. Great Barrington Declaration. So be yeah. careful about, uh, damn, that was fast. <laughs> I was. I wanted um, to make sure I heard it right. So I was like, Google. Google. Um, but yeah, no, there's a lot of bad science out there. And unfortunately right now, like, especially with um, this last administration, it empowered a lot of anti-science and anti-vax movements. Um, I encourage everyone, actually, if you can look up uh, Dr. Pete Hotez, uh, absolutely amazing man um, on Twitter. He's basically fighting a one man of the fight uh, against this information as well. And we were all trying to help him, but he go, he's one of the few people who is willing to go onto any news, like Fox News, Breitbart, all these places to sit there and discuss vaccine safety and the virus and masking and everything. And just, you know, squash like misinformation um and you can get a better idea in terms of like what some of the many issues that these health freedom or anti-vax movements have come in but we stumbled um uh, but i won't go as far as to say that we horribly failed um in fact i think it's a testament to our success the fact that we were able to recover this much despite a year of basically not being able to do anything um and so i think that there's a lot to be said here but uh if we Pray to God, I'm knocking on wood, that we have another global pandemic. Uh, and if we do this again, then it is a failure on every level of public health and medicine in general. All right. So thank you for that. We actually had a question here from chat. Uh, Yami Pon is asking, why does the AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson vaccines have less protection, I guess lower percentage efficiency, uh, against COVID compared to the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines? Is it because they work differently or the shell system is not working as well as intended yet? Uh, well, the shell doesn't have anything to do with the, it, the shell has nothing to do with like the actual immune response, uh, to be clear. We don't know what exactly, why exactly there is a difference of it, but I just to be clear too, AstraZeneca and J&J still mount a very effective response um, you know, it's not as like high as 99, 90 something percent or 80 percent and everything like that, but it's still significantly high. And I tell everyone that anything above like 50 to 60 percent is actually very good for a vaccine. I tell that to everyone, um, especially when you look at a perspective of like the fact that a lot of these folks who do get it. Remember, the vaccines are there to serve one particular purpose. It's to reduce the severity of the disease and to prevent you from dying. So if you let's say if, you know, I'm sitting next to Snow and I, I have COVID, I give it to Snow and she's vaccinated with AstraZeneca, you know, she probably won't mount as like a robust of a response, but she's not going to, she probably might have a fever, maybe a fever at most or a cough for a few days, but then she'll recover um, in that she won't have to be hospitalized. She won't have to go to hospital and burden our health system. She won't die as a result of it. And that's when a vaccine is successful. And it's something we always need to remember when we talk about vaccines. It's not about preventing infections. It's about ensuring the fact that we're reducing hospitalizations and deaths as a result of it. Yeah, I think that's a really good point to make because I think when people think vaccines, they think I won't get it, period. Right. But that's no. not the case. Correct. No, absolutely not. If that's and, I, and if anyone tells you that, please tell remind them that no, no vaccine. Uh, there's only like I think one or two that have what we call sterilizing immunity, which it basically shuts down everything that happens with like replication. But that's very rare. And like for this case right here, this is not. But if anyone tells you that, you know, oh, it prevents infection, that's very wrong. It's so wrong. Like it's it's there to basically ensure that. Even if you do get COVID, that you're not like, you're not sitting there transmitting like crazy, that you're not, you know, being, you're not very sick and you're not dying in the deathbed as a result of it. So, yeah, I think that's a very important distinction to make because I think people think that it's, you know, going to prevent them from getting it, but that's not yep. the case. Um, our next question here is from Batch asking, what is your opinion on the lockdowns as a pandemic response? Um, this is a very controversial answer. I don't like lockdowns. Lockdowns should be the last last ditch effort to do it. Um, that being said, in situations where, commu where community transmission is very high and our health systems are burning down to the ground, 
lockdowns should be the case. Uh, and I say that because of the fact that we have to think about, it's not a, this is a very nuanced question, question and answer to it. So I want people to understand that most of us who are, who, who are worth their salt in terms of working in health and public health, we don't ever promote lockdown. In fact, we want to avoid lockdowns. We're basically saying vaccinate, uh, socially distance, wash your hands, all the stuff so that we don't fucking get to the point, excuse my language, no, <laughs> of you're locking good. We down. Do that here. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, we don't want to get to that point. But if we do get to that point, it's a very last ditch. It's like the emergency button you smash to your right of you and say, okay, guys, we're going to lock down everything. And it's not something we ever want to get to, but it does have to happen if something happens where we are so overwhelmed that we have nothing else left to do. Uh, and lockdowns don't do anything in terms of helping people's health as well, in terms of like mental health, excuse me. Uh, it can, I mean, a lot of places where you have seen like lockdowns, you have seen people who have mentally suffered for as a result of it. Uh, I won't say that it's been great because you're telling people to basically like, hey, for the next three months, you can't go out until unless of essential travel. Um, and you know, if you feel like that and look at incarcerated people, but, <laughs> um, but there are challenges behind there. So, um, we are, anyone who's in the public health field, who's worth the salt, want to avoid it. That's why we want to do all these initiatives. That's why we want to vaccinate, that's why we want to mask, mask. And it's why we beg people to do this. So we don't get to that point. Very, very good. Yeah, we've talked about things like lockdowns in our stream in the past. And it, it you're yeah. right, it is a very controversial thing. Um, because, you know, uh, I think people just think that, you know, lockdowns are the answer. And, and while I agreed initially, I've kind of learned that it's not necessarily the one all be all solution. We should be focusing much more about like, well, how can we address current situation now so that we don't get to that point, right? Like, um, and once again, like if it gets to a point where lockdowns has to happen, then it has to happen. Like, especially if your community transmission levels are so high, like Michigan, for example, parts of Michigan, they are so bad with their infections and their ICU beds it's overwhelmed. Like it's unfair to say we can't lock down because at that point, it's like if you continue being lackadaisical, then your health system will collapse. And that's not something we want to see happen. Um, so please protect us. <laughs> I like it. All right. Our next question from Batch is, why has the medical system, for seemingly the first time in history, been so scared to improvise and try medications and interventions with a great safety record? Not just hydroxychloroquine, I can't say it, okay. yep. <laughs> uh, which seems to have fallen out of favor, that seemed to show effectiveness in treating COVID-19. So this is a good question, and I want to make sure I come with this with a balanced response. Um, a lot of the interventions are actually evaluated. I'll tell you that right now. We are looking at hydroxychloroquine, colchicine, ivermectin, vitamin D, monoclonal antibodies. All of these are actually still being evaluated in terms of therapeutic options. And I tell this in terms of the perspective of the fact that we're looking at it in a way that actually make sure that people who do get it um, have a reduced uh, hospitalizations and all this other stuff. However, we, you know, one of the many things that we have to think about when we look at therapeutic options is risk factors too, right? So for example, for hydroxychloroquine, that's a very controversial one because a lot of folks were saying, well, why aren't we doing it? I'll tell you right now, and I'll say this, when I first started looking into this pandemic earlier this year, like when it first started kicking off, hydroxychloroquine was one of the promising drugs we were looking at because it was already available. It was cheap to make. Uh, it was it had anti-inflammatory properties. It's something that was already circulated. Um, and thank you for the subs. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, one of the many things we had seen after doing many evidence studies, uh, and I say that we've done many studies and you can look at many of the ones and I can link many of them, that we have seen inconsistent and actually most of the big ones have actually shown that it was not statistically significant to the point where it reduces the stay of a hospitalized hospitalized patient as well. Um, and it didn't actually show the lower viral count. It didn't viral load. It didn't like, you know, do anything in terms of like reducing uh, severity of the disease. And so 
that's the first perspective, right? Is that we looked at it from a data perspective and it's still ongoing. There's still several studies that are going. So don't think that we're not looking into it. Actually, every hospital is something that we want. We would love to see something like this, but we just haven't seen anything to purport the fact that it actually has mounted an effective response. The second being the fact that for risk factors associated, there's been several studies that have shown that things like such as uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, actually ended up causing a lot more issues for patients because of some of the major side effects and major like uh, things such as QT prolongation and all that stuff where, you know, harder was like heart issues as a result of it because we're administering high doses of hydroxychloroquine in order for it to be effective. It's not something small. It's not like, okay, well, here's a penny of hydroxychloroquine. You should be good to go. It's a lot. And, it, and even then, it didn't really show anything that was so statistically significant that we would be something that everyone should do it. Now, that being said, um, you know, it, it's still, we're still evaluating things. Like there's still studies that are ongoing, but I can tell you right now from the many studies I've seen, and I've been looking at this for a whole year right now, that nothing has shown statistically significant results that have really, really, it would be something that a doctor would recommend, especially if you are in an ICU in a critical bed right now, like we, it, it won't do anything. Like it just won't do anything that's gonna mount an effective response, even though in principle, when we look at it, the mechanism of hydroxychloroquine or of ivermectin should work. It's different from in vitro versus actually practicing it. And we've seen that in the real life data set that it doesn't do it. Um, so I don't want this assumption, the fact that the health systems aren't, aren't looking into it, we are. In fact, we want to see it happen, but we just haven't seen anything from the research perspective and everything to report that fact that those interventions have actually mounted an effective response for it. Um, and so that being said, um, you know, and again, if anyone still has issues regarding hydroxychloroquine or these, like a lot of these interventions, we're doing that. Right now, we did find that dexamethasone, which is one of the many drugs that we have seen, uh, is actually one of the recommended drugs uh, for some of the severe patients of uh, COVID. Um, and that's because we saw some real life data that was like, oh, this is actually pretty cool. And uh, it's now part of guidance now within there. Um, if you guys also want to think about it from real life perspective, there's a reason why our death has kind of tapered off a little bit is because we're very smarter about, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a cortical steroid batch. Uh, we've been smarter about realizing signals and we're much more better about making sure that we are treating patients correct. Uh, we're treating patients and we're also testing them quickly. We're getting them in there much faster and we're doing better job about it. But that doesn't mean that it's not like it's something we shouldn't take seriously. We should take this seriously. Um, but yeah, like, and someone always points out, well, look at President Trump. That man re basically received like the missile, to, like basically every single treatment you could think of that was available to mankind. Um, and you could tell like he was not himself at the end of it. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, comporting factor that was not great about it either. His oxygen level didn't show any promise and, um, and all sort of stuff. And so we have to think about, uh, not all treatments are effective for everyone. And then also how careful we have to be about uh, generalizing treatment options because uh, not everyone can be the candidate for those treatments as well. So hopefully that answered your question, Batch. Um, I'm happy to provide substantial evidence regarding how we can look at a lot of these interventions as well. But uh, I can tell you from a data perspective and from a, uh, you know, a health perspective as well, that it has not shown any benefits that I would consider a significant amount for that. Uh, I had a question. So what is the general other than that, that steroid, what is the general like medications or, you know, what doctors actually prescribe to people who have COVID? I mean, that's the main one. I mean, we've seen, mon and I know there's a question about monoclonal antibodies. That's that's sort of one, but it hasn't really done a fantastic job. Um, I'll actually show, let me show, let me see if I could show you guys what, um, I guess, I mean, so that this website right our, here, you can actually question. see what exactly goes through the mind of a lot of folks when they see a patient uh, posting in a chat right now. Okay. Um, and I can tell you right now, this is something that most folks look through uh, in the field uh, to see that. I would say, look through it. Like everything is there. You guys can see, like they link studies uh, to show what is going on, what has worked, what doesn't work. Um, 
you know, and the thing is that for us, I'm telling everyone right now that there is no, it's not like we're getting money out of treating patients with certain drugs or not. It's not like, it's not like if I get everyone a hydroxychloroquine, I make 10 bucks per patient. It's not working in this case right here. Uh, but please feel free to post through that website if you are curious from a, you know, data perspective or from the studies perspective. Uh, it's very detailed and everything um, on that. And you guys can always, uh, my Twitter is open. You guys can ping me on Snow's Discord. Ask questions. Like, seriously, ask questions. And you ask your questions to, um, you know, your doctors as well, if you can have access to that. So so you mentioned it. Um, this goes into our next question from Batch. Why are public health messengers not telling people and doctors about monoclonal antibodies? We are. Uh, we are. And actually, right now, we have recently saw, so there's several monoclonal antibodies that are being produced by Lilly. Uh, and Regeneron. And we've seen that in terms of like, one of them actually got their emergency use authorization revoked, uh, BAM Lana Ivimab. That one was not shown to have any clinical significance or statistical significance in actually uh, supporting uh, treatment for it. Um, one of the many things too, we have realized as well that um, when we start treating people with monoclonal antibodies is usually for a very specific set of patients. And it's usually for people who are, uh, you know, mild to moderate uh, severity and symptoms who are hospitalized. So think about it from that perspective. It's very small percentage of folks that was uh, doing from in terms of like that proportion in a hospital. And even then, like it wasn't, we saw that a lot of data wasn't really showing it. And we have, and the problem is that I think about it from this perspective. When we look at monoclonal antibodies, uh, there's a reason why it's called mono. It's, it's, own, it's only like essentially an antibody that's addressing one aspect of the clone, the, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. It's only, it's kind of like if we were to look at, um, let me think of a good example here. Um, if you've got a master key to one house, that master key might not work for the next house over. That's kind of where like the monoclonal antibody works from this case right here. Uh, but convalescent plasma, that's one of the other ones that people have seen is, is, um, uh, is also poly, is polyclonal. Uh, so monoclonal, polyclonal. Um, that has like multiple like master keys, right? Uh, even that hasn't really shown mounted an effective therapeutic response um, in a lot of patients. Um, we st we saw some promising data at the beginning, but I think in the face of variants and all this other stuff that's been going on, um, we've seen that the effectiveness of this the you know these therapeutic options have really started diminishing um, as time went by. And I think what we'll end up seeing is that they will be phased out, or in this case, they might be used in combination. So you might have multiple monoclonal antibodies being used. So you have multiple master keys for multiple houses, just in case, to see if it might reduce severity of symptoms. But the thing is, is that like, if you're vaccinated and at that point, hopefully we don't have to get to the point where you're hospitalized for that. So um, that's, that's kind of many, many thought process regarding that. Okay. Very interesting. I didn't even know there were all these different like interventions and, and therapeutic mm -hmm. treatments in general, because I, there I are. personally don't know anybody who, I guess other than my brother, but I don't think he had any kind of treatment. He just kind of, you know, sucked it up and survived it at home. But like, I didn't know if, you know, mm -hmm. what, what doctors were doing, right, for people that have symptoms and are in the hospitals. You have to also think about like what type of patients would go into a hospital, right? Like right. if usually at that point, it's like it's severe enough that you have to go to a hospital. Either it's, I would say, like moderate or you're very you're very uh, you're very cautious and you're being admitted to do that. Or it's very severe to the point where basically you have to be intubated or you might have to look at dexamethasone or anything like that. Um, there's a lot of things that we have to think about, but um from that perspective, we have to, you know, there's multiple sort of like avenues for us to really deal with severe patients. Um, but again, it's one of those things that like, if we had more, if the monoclonal antibodies have really, really mounted a much more effective response, I'd be happy to include that as a treatment regimen, but it just has not been anything statistically significant um, over and over again. And so, um, and you got, and again, all of this is available, publicly available data. You guys can go and check out uh, Bamlana Bam Ivimab and um, and also Regeneron's 
um, monoclonal antibodies and check the data. I mean, I think, I think Regeneron might be still kicking the bucket down the line still in terms of like showing some efficacy, but um, you know, I think a lot of like, you'll hear a lot of conspiracy theorists and a lot of people who are talking about it where doctors are not allowing this because they think that, you know, it's promoting something or some hidden agenda. It's usually just because of the fact that we feel like it's not something that actually will really make a huge amount of difference that your immune system can already mount in terms of like that, especially if you're a mild case. So we have to think about that, you know, from a uh, treatment perspective. Also, it doesn't make any sense if we're charging you for this. And, uh, you know, I don't think I think right now we're, we're still we're still covering some of the cost of it, but it's not exactly cheap either. So. Batch was saying the, what is it, bamlanivimab was being used mm -hmm. on older people with moderate COVID to keep them out of the hospital. Please correct if he's it, wrong. It was. Um, and it, eventually we started seeing the fact that it was starting, it was more just the fact that, uh, <laughs> so we did a control study, right? We were looking at people, the elderly population that had moderate conditions that had bamlanivimab versus ones who got a placebo um, and realized that the fact that there was no statistical significance that showed uh, effectiveness of the therapeutic option for those. Um, in combination with others, possibly, but by itself, it wasn't showing anything. All right. Well, I was going to ask one more, but we're kind of basically at time. And wait, we still have a ton of questions, <laughs> by the way. We still, oh, let's do one more question here from Yami Pon. Um, asking, let me get it on the screen here. Uh, how has it been for doctors and other hospital staff to keep COVID out of their homes while dealing with so many patients? Has it taken a toll on Dr. Neuro specifically or any of his coworkers? How are you all dealing with this mentally? One day at a time. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we do different things such as like, you know, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget this example from my husband, who's a doc, who's a emergency medicine doctor. Um, you know, we're a power couple, <laughs> uh, but he would just come home from after an emergency room and just strip down in the hallway in this or an apartment, uh, strip all of his scrubs off and put it into a bag, um, just to make sure that we were not. Uh, bringing that home we i have like HEPA air filters or portable HEPA air filters everywhere i you know make sure i keep a certain humidity index in the house to ensure safety even that um, i don't touch my cats even though they're meowing like incessantly when i come home because i have to wash my hand before i touch my cats because we've shown that pets can get COVID as well um so it's been stressful um but we've been coping uh, I think the more disheartening factor really is when we hear uh, people who promote conspiracy theories about us or can promote like this like sense of like that we are there to profit off of patients. And um, I won't deny that there are bad doctors that are out there, but there are genuinely many good ones out there who are and public health experts and infectious disease people who want to see the end of this like so bad, like it does not do us any good about it so um you know i think if you ever hear those conspiracy theories like try to try to like question it and really make sure you let people know that that's not the case here all right very good so that was a very good last question we are at, unfortunately out of time for this session uh, there are a ton of questions we still have not answered that we did get via the Google form uh, when I was collecting questions last week. So if you didn't get your question answered today, don't worry. We're not going to leave you hanging or anything like that. Uh, we will be doing a second session. Dr. Nero did talk with me, right? We're going to do a second session. We'll be yes. scheduling that and letting you all know. So any any last comments, Dr. Nero? Um. Something I've been wanting to do, uh, it's a little self-promoting, so I apologize in advance. No, no, go for um, it. I, um, I have been promoting very much to everyone the fact that uh, if you have, if you know other Twitch streamers, if you know any other communities that need someone to come in to do these Q&As, I am available. I would love to communicate, connect more. Uh, Snow was very generous in reaching out to me. She was actually one of the first people to reach out to me oh, on that yay. tweet I made. So it made me really happy, um, the fact that there are people out there. And uh, I don't get money out of this. I don't get 
it's not like I, I'm, I'm here to share the information. I don't profit off of this. I, I, it's not, I'm not cloud chasing. I don't really care. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, my thing is like making sure that the people get the right information. Uh, people have access to resources and people know exactly where to go to. Uh, if you would like to have, if you would like to support additionally as well, uh, feel free to visit our website, COVID Act Now. Uh, that, is a, that is a website that we have created with me and my team uh, to assess risk. Also, also getting better idea and better education on COVID in the United States. Um, and we would, I would love it if you guys could take a look, you guys can register for emails and things, stuff like that to get better data and better research papers out every week. I'm happy to go into detail about that. Um, yeah. And that's about it really. Like, and you guys know, you see me in discord, I'm, I'm posting daily, mostly daily updates on congressional updates. You guys can ping me in the health channel or in the general channel, about questions you have regarding COVID, uh, if you something read something in the other day and you're like, I'm gonna need neuro to <laughs> set this or check back check this, ping me. I'm okay to answer. I might not respond to you immediately, but I'm pretty good about responding pretty quickly. Um, and support my Twitter really. Like my Twitter is my heart and soul. Really, I I do a lot more on there. Um, and I prom and I try to tweet as much as I can uh, about what's going on with COVID, what's going on with treatments, what's going on with all these studies. Um, and what you can do to be a better person about reading a lot of this stuff. So um, I'm the, the best thing I could hear from anyone, especially in these chats, is I learned something new today. So very that's good. It for me. And just so people, again, if anybody's catching this at some random point and they don't know who you are, go ahead and introduce yourself again. I know I'm asking you to do this a lot, but <laughs> just so people have an idea, you know, and know who you are and where you're coming from and why you know so much. So I'm Neuro Fourier. I am a I am a global health advisor for the U.S. State Department. Um, I do focus on a lot of infectious diseases and a lot of humanitarian crisis settings or developing nations. Um, I've experienced many work within HIV/AIDS, Ebola, tuber tuberculosis, malaria, and a lot of a lot of infectious disease that uh, you guys have probably heard about, but don't really see because of the craziness of the world. Um, and I like to bring a lot of policy discussions and also pu public health discussions to the board. So um, my focus on a lot of my Twitch items and everything and Twitter is to focus on uh, good health science communication um, so that people who aren't scientifically savvy have a better understanding of what's going on in the world, um, how better to, you know, what we can do better, um, and also making sure that um, right information is being spread rather than the bad information that we're seeing out there. So um, this is a this is a unique time and opportunity for all of us to be better information stewards, as I like to say. So that's it for me. Yeah. So everyone, please, please, please follow Dr. Nero's Twitter. You can follow his Twitch as well, but his Twitter's his main platform that he's spreading this information and talking and everything. Uh, again, I put the information there. My mods are linking. Um, go follow, follow Dr. Nero on all the things and definitely reach out to him if you have any questions. Um, don't forget, though, we still have plenty of questions. We just can't cover them tonight because we don't have enough time. But we are going to plan a second session, a follow-up session to today's discussion. So please look <laughs> forward to that. Uh, keep an eye on Dr. Neuro's Twitter, on my Twitter, um, for when that's going to be. But it will be semi-soonish, just whenever our scheduling matches up. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Neuro. This was amazing. Thank you again. Yeah, I really enjoyed I it. I learned it. a lot. There's a lot I didn't know. I mean, I, there's a lot I don't know anyway. But I think it it's was really, really cool to talk about it with somebody who knows what they're talking about. So thank Absolutely. You. I'm, I'm glad that you guys learned something new today. I appreciate it. Yeah, so I look forward to that. Session two will be coming soon. Um, but yeah, thank <laughs> you again, Dr. Nero. Have a good rest of your evening. Say hello you to your cats for us. <laughs> it will do. All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Whoops. That's mod chat. Let me switch. <laughs> All righty, folks. Um, oh, gosh. Let me turn this back on. Here we are. I'm here. Do you all see me? It's so dark in here. Where's my other light? There we go. Oh. All righty, folks. Do you all remember me? I'm here again. <laughs> Alrighty, we we uh, we still have a ton of questions, by the way. 
Um, so if you're wondering, again, I don't know if Dr. Nero is out there listening to the stream. Thank you so, so much. fan freaking tastic It was really cool to sit down, and I can't wait for our next session already. Like, I'm super excited for the next session already. <laughs> of course, we'll schedule that. Um, again, if you didn't get your question answered, because I know a lot of people submitted questions. If we didn't get to your question tonight, I promise you we will. It'll just be on the next session, which will let you know when that's going to be. Um, and if anyone missed this, the VOD will be, you know, saved. Uh, you'll be able to watch it again after the fact, as well as I'm going to export it to my YouTube as well. So, yeah. Batch says, Dr. Nero knows what they're talking about and, two knows how to communicate it. Well, I mean, Dr. Nero specializes in messaging, if I'm not mistaken. Just public health messaging in general as well. Just, just communication about it all. So, this was awesome. Pixelated, you'll be posting this VOD around. Please do. Please share it. Um, I think this is really useful information. You know, not just for our community, but for like everybody, right? Like I, like I said, COVID has impacted all of us. And there's a lot of rumors out there. There's a lot of misinformation, right? There's a lot of hesitance, hesitance, hesitancy. I don't know what the word is. Hesitation. <laughs> there's a lot of hesitation, right? In terms of, um, you know, what's going on, whether people are allowed to, you know, go out, whether vaccines are effective or whatever so i'm hoping this discussion helped that was a lot of really good information really good conversations and um yeah i'm just i'm just hoping people learned today hi furious fur hi road trip welcome to the stream dr snowy yeah so i know now okay i know now i know we had a bit of uh not technical difficulties but i i mispositioned the layout the overlay for the cameras so it's always going to put me on the right side when it's a two-person call. Just got to remember that. <laughs> At least that won't be an issue next time for the second session. But there will be a pop quiz later. Exactly. Pop quiz. You're all going to be tested. But no, I, I learned quite a bit. I think that was really, really, I mean, not just for the community, but for me too. I There's a lot I didn't know. So it was really cool to chat about it. Oh, thank you, Yami Pon. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to give you all a chance to ask questions because I don't think we really get opportunities like this as a community in general, at least with me. Um, so I do hope again that if you missed it, watch the VOD, you know. Um, you can always, like Dr. Neuro said, reach out to him too if you have a specific question that wasn't covered. His DMs are open, he says, right? So he's also part of our Discord server. So if you see him, say hello in there, chat with him, say hi back to him, you know? Um, and like I said, follow him on Twitter, especially. You can also follow him on Twitch. He does stream occasionally, um, but definitely follow him on Twitter at least. Um, highly recommend it. It was a very important stream. You both did something amazing today. Oh, did we? Thanks, Sleepy. <laughs> this was a good chat. Classo, you'll need to go back and watch the bit that you missed on the AAPI section. Yeah, that part was a little on the quiet side, but I feel like I've been, you know, I've been going on about it for a long time, so I'm not surprised chat was pretty quiet. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think, like I said, it's very important for us to keep talking about these things, and uh, we'll continue to, you know, in a balanced, productive way. 